Okay, so uh, I'd like to go ahead and call to order the uh, the regular uh, 7 to 6 p.m. meeting, April 26, of the uh, Citizens Budget Committee. Uh, we'll all uh, stand and have a pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. At this time, I'd like to call for any uh, any public comment uh, for non-agenda items. Any public comment on anything that's not on the agenda. All right. Since there's none. Uh, Move to uh, agenda item number four, uh, approval of the minutes of the April 19th, 2018 meeting. Which would require a motion from the... I move to approve the minutes of the April 19th meeting as written and posted on the website. Second. Okay. Uh, Member Schler moves to Second. approve. Oh, sorry. Member, gosh darn, I'm sorry, I forgot your last name. Sims. Member Sims seconds. Ready for the roll call? I think so. Cindy Berger? Yes. Larry Whitney? Yes. Vice Chairman Kevin Rucker? Yes. Millie Sims? Yes. Andrew Schler? Yes. Chairman Chastain? Yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, agenda item number five, um, question and answer session regarding the previous meeting. Yes. So, um, one, one of the things we wanted to provide you under this agenda item is uh, to cover some of the things you all have requested at the last meeting, some additional pieces of information that we've been working on gathering for you. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to say what I told you I would say at every meeting, which is reminding, reminding everyone of our big picture theme as we go into this evening's discussion. So once again, we are trying to look for ideas to increase existing revenues, find new revenue sources, to decrease expenditures. Just, you know, the three big ticket things that I'll try to keep mentioning to keep us consistent. Um, the values are up there, as you are aware, and... Uh, at the next meeting, you'll actually get into looking at the values compared to services and things like that, which I'll go over at the end. But that is our theme. And the thing that we've added online, which hopefully you've seen, um, if not, please plan to take a look if you're interested. And, and also, I should say, every time I'm adding things to the website, I'm just adding it to the end of the list. You know, there's two different sections, one that are things that are more pertinent to building the budget and one that are just other resources. I'll always add it to the bottom to make it a little easier for you to find what's new. Um, but we added in the, um, the three CRA agreements, the Community Redevelopment Agency agreements we talked about last week, as well as there's a, an overview document that, that attempts to make it a little easier to understand what each of those agreements actually do to the budget. So when you look at that overview, it actually gives you the specific number that's in the 17-18 budget and tells you which agreement that's pulled from and how it's calculated if it's, if it's a calculation thing. So anyway, all of that is out there. It's for reference. Um, we also added the uh, city vehicle list, which includes the age of vehicles and the mileage of those vehicles. So that's up there. Um, additionally, we had added up the, uh, the overtime information. We talked a little bit about that last time. So what Brittany did is she pulled each department's overtime, um, the actuals and the budget numbers, and she did that for the past three years. So this year is obviously just a year-to-date figure, and um, we don't have that at the handout, right? We don't have that at the handout, so it's online. Um, and the other thing I would just mention is when you see the overtime numbers for 16, 17, you'll see how high those are in certain departments, and that is because of the two hurricanes that year. So that gives you a sense of what that overtime, um, how that impacts the budget that year. 
And uh, the other two things I had were, we had given you the five-year forecast last time, and we had realized that the details on the new construction, um, when those were coming online, the values were missing. So that's actually a, a handout in front of you. It's a little small piece of paper, or a paper with not much on it. Yeah. So that's just what was missing from that first page of the, the uh, forecast. And the last thing was we talked about the stormwater master plan and where that was at and when we'll know numbers. And I've, I've checked in with our city engineer and we're supposed to get that final stormwater master plan within the next couple of weeks. So once I have that, we should be a little closer to having numbers where we can look at what does it take. I think, Larry, you will make one of the folks to ask that question. You know, how many years might it take us to get to a place where we're, everything is good, you know, kind of thing, and what would that funding look like? So that's what we're waiting on there. And other than that, those were all the follow-up items I had at least prioritized to make sure I answered for you guys today. But if there, if there was anything we talked about last week that we've been thinking about, we had other questions, we just wanted to use this as our, our initial opportunity to try to answer those for you if there was anything else that came up. I think I had asked for, <coughs> excuse me, um, the, at least the last um, citizen survey that was done. Thank you. Um, so I will follow up with you on that. Um, I actually talked to John Fergus, who's not here tonight, because he's been involved in city. He, he's over at sustainability meeting, actually. Otherwise, he wouldn't be here. Yes. yes, I understand. Yes. Um, but I talked to him because he had a lot of just historical knowledge. Right, right. And I did confirm it was the 2011 that was the last survey, but I have not found the final report. The only thing I've found so far is um, a document that says it is the, um, I think, preliminary results. So I'm, I'm seeking that final document because I, I have no context for whether the preliminary actually is truly the case. I think it's possible that we only ever got the preliminary. Oh, really? I'm trying to remember back, yeah. I think it always Well, was that was a question I need to ask John because he actually also emailed me a, a long narrative of all the past times that he could remember we had done city surveys. Mm -hmm. So that is still on my list to follow up. I just didn't have that right for you tonight. Are they typically done every so many years, or just randomly? Yeah, yeah he, he had mentioned several over a course of maybe like three decades. So it didn't sound, and don't quote me on three decades, but it didn't sound like it was happening with any, like, every five years or anything. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, other than that, any other follow-up items, questions? Um, I just had a question. I, I did go out and look at the survey results for other uh, cities our size, and mm -hmm. one of the things I noticed at Satellite Beach... Was missing. Okay. I, I realized that. I apologize for that. We're going to get that corrected, so you have the actual data that helps you do the comparison? Yes. Yeah. Ah. It, has. it sort of hit me like a little lightning bolt, or a bolt, I guess, the other day, so we'll get that for you. Yeah. Um, anything else? Okay, I have uh, one thing that I would uh, like to ask that we do uh, this during this meeting. Um, it, it occurred to me in our last meeting that there are some of the members of the committee that are, let's just say, less assertive about, uh, you know, about getting their getting their selves in there to ask questions or make comments or something like that. And after you know speaking with uh, Suzanne. Uh, at the end of the meeting uh, last time, it also seems very important that we're able to have, you know, kind of an open uh, discussion type of forum. But what I'd like to do, if it's okay with everybody, is, uh, you know, as we go along, when something comes to mind and you do want to ask a question or make a comment or something, just go ahead and raise your hand or look at me or something like that, and I'll put your name on a little list here that I keep, and then I'll come to each person in, in that order. So you'll still get to get in there and everything, but you don't have to worry about somebody else getting in there, you know, on top of you just because they they do it faster or more. So we decided last meeting that we would have an open discussion process, like the first meeting, and then in the third meeting we would go to a more structured answer, question and answer and speaking environment. Well, and this is. Uh, to my way of seeing this is something of a compromise there. I mean, in deference to the recording secretary and the, you know, as I said, other committee members. I mean, I found myself a couple of times last meeting wanting to get a word in edgewise and, and couldn't. And, and usually I can when I want to do something like that. Yeah, so I'm 
so as I understood the concept, that we're, we're still going to have the flow of conversation during, as we go along through our presentation. So we're not like waiting to the end or anything? For, that's what I'm asking for. Yeah, we still do that the same way, but you know, you do it, you do it in order. around the table instead of raising our hands. We just kind of went around the table and saw if anyone had a comment and everyone had a couple minutes to get there. That's what everybody said no to last time. The, the more formal. Yeah. That would be our more formal version. The less formal is like, as soon as you, as soon as one of us says something you guys want to ask a question about, I guess what Judge is asking for, your hand pops up and then, you know, we, we pause and then he recognizes you and we do it that way kind of deal. Yeah, either I, either the chair can recognize the person or whoever happens to be presenting at that time. Right. Yeah. Is that all right with everyone? So require a motion? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, that was that was all I had for that. Uh, so, uh, moving on then to agenda item number six, presentation of res revenues and expenditures. Do we have any public comments uh, regarding agenda item number six? Okay, since there's none, we'll uh, hand it back to uh, staff. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, there are a few things we wanted to go over with you tonight to, again, further, um, particularly further focus on explaining the various revenue sources uh, for the city. So we're, we're going to get into that at quite a, a good level of detail. But before we did that, uh, one of the things that has been on the website since we, since we started this has been a, um, a document that was presented to city council reflecting uh, proposed revenue increases and how those would affect like the average residents and how those would bring in, what, what revenues those would bring into the city. And so to give you some, we felt like it was important for us to go back through that. If you were at the city council meeting that night, you probably heard that. Um, but we're gonna bring that back up and just run through that for the entire group because I don't think everyone was there for that. Um, in part because Number one, that's information that's already presented to council, but the other reason is it gives you some context for some of the things that we're going to talk about when we get into our actual revenue line item by line item here in, in a little bit. So you do have a handout in front of you. Grab your candy. It looks, looks kind of like this. It is titled um, Overview of Proposed Increases to Add Warm, Stormwater, Utility Tax, and Waste Management Franchise Team. And then it goes yeah. right on top. It, it's originally in Excel. We have it online as a PDF, and I believe the uh, correct me if I want to say, but I believe the title references it was presented on April 4th yes. at the City Council. Yes. So when you look for it online. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's You're welcome. So what we had been asked to do at staff level was to take all of the potential areas in which we could increase revenues, given this impending homestead exemption, all those areas and just kind of put them together in an analysis and say this is what those would bring in if we if we increase them in a certain way and this is how they would impact residents. So I'm going to ask Brady to kind of go through that just kind of high level overview for you and again if you've got questions as we go through it you know, please just let us know. Okay so at the top um, we'll just briefly discussed the ad warm. We kind of went into that last time we were speaking about all this. So when council asked me to, to ask the staff to do this, they wanted to know, you know on, on average, how much is the property owner going to be increased on the property taxes? So at the time, you will see that I have done, I've added up all the satellite beach residents um, for the assessed values, all of their exemptions, and then their total taxable value, and then what we, what their current at the 8.1518, and then what the proposed is, and the difference. So I wanted to be very clear that if it was decided to raise the millage rate to an 8.4, it's only an additional $210,000 to the city. And we briefly discussed last time, we have a $600,000 homestead exemption hole that we're trying to, to fill, and at norm would only be an additional $200,000. So below that is the average. Um, of the assessed values, the exemptions, et cetera, et cetera, and then the difference would be $41. So on average, it would be about a $40 increase to property owners. Yeah. Um, 
So will we ask questions along the way? Or, um, mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so um, the ad valorem only two hundred ten thousand dollars, but you're trying to cover a six hundred thousand dollar shortfall, right? So That's why only two hundred thousand dollars? Well, it, it was looking at trying to, I mean, to raise the ad valorem to cover the full six hundred thousand dollars would make the ad valorem go up quite much higher than where it's at currently. So we were right. trying to do something that would increase it to help us, but not be completely detrimental to the citizens of the city. So I guess I just object to that philosophy of uh, we're facing a shortfall, so let's increase our income, right? And you're increasing it by only a, a, a small amount, a, a, you know, well, not a whole amount, just a bit of amount as we go along, right? So it seems kind of, why don't we, again, trim a little bit instead of just incrementally thinking about the, the taxes. Well, just to add two things to that, so this, when we get through the full, the full document here, you'll see there's two other items that we're, propose, that we're proposing to increase in general fund that help, also help to kind of um, deal with that $600,000 gap. Um, they include utility tax and waste management franchise fee, which, you know, add roughly another 250000 or so. Again, it doesn't fully close the gap, but puts us in that right direction. And to, an, uh, to answer your other part, that is part of why you're on the committee, you know, to, to give us those ideas that are different than this. So this is just a place we started as, as, as that level based on direction we got. So. I think Member Berger had something and then Whitney. Yeah, I just want to say it's, we had us 30% uh, of the way there, so it, it's not insignificant. Uh, um, and I'm not of the belief that you can completely cut your way to balance budget because there are always variables. We've got to look at revenue streams in addition to to balancing it with appropriate cuts where possible. So um, I, I just wanted to make that statement. The other question I had is for the, the team, the staff. Um, have you looked at other variables higher than 8.4? Because I'm sure you play these things out in the spreadsheet. We have looked at them, and one of the things that's why you ha we presented the five-year um, financial forecast, because we were using that 8.4 in that forecast to get us down to what we could raise the millage rate and be able to <coughs> still do what we needed to do without having to raise any higher than 8.4. Okay. So that financial forecast that we presented last week, if, if, I don't know if any of you guys brought it with you this time around, but you will see that the net position at 8.4 had a positive number in it. Um, so we were working through those numbers. As Suzanne said, we'll get to the fact that we were talking about raising the waste um, management fee. We actually raised uh, the recreation fees um, a few meetings ago. We're looking at other options to be able to raise instead of actually pushing it all out to the citizens. Uh, Mr. Whitney. Yeah. Um, in terms of presentation for this type of committee, I would have expected, but no. Let me say my, my, what would have made me more comfortable is not that you or city council or whoever already decided we want to try to keep it at a certain number, but I prefer that you did this at 8.15. 8.3, 8.4, 8.5, 8.6, 8.7. So we can see what the incremental differences are. We're not saying, oh, go to that number, we're done. We're saying that gives us a picture of what it would look like to raise that. In, in other line item categories, we could do probably some of the same kinds of things. Otherwise, you've already predetermined that there's a cap on what you're willing to do on a certain line item, and I'm not sure why. I have no clue why. Okay. Nobody wants to raise taxes. We understand that, but yeah. but in order to analyze what we're doing here, how do you walk into the meeting and already decide that this is shut down, this one is wide open? It, it doesn't make any sense. To me. It's a fair point, and, and I, you're right. I mean, my caveat to this should just be that this is merely one of like a hundred scenarios that could be out there. It, it's it's a good point. And, and the way we built the five-year financial forecast is in such a way that we can plug in any millage rate and everything calculates and changes. Mm -hmm. I say we, Brittany, the wonderful Excel expert did that. So, um, so we have that capacity and we can 
you know, if it becomes something that's a tool that you all need, we can build that in such a way or bring that bring that document up actually in Excel and we can make those changes to your live and in person just so you can see the impact. I'm not interested in seeing it going up forever, but, but at least perhaps until the difference number becomes 600,000. Understood. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and actually. And then, and then we could say, well, we could do it all in this line item, but this is the impact. Right. Okay. So we could actually coming. get that for you tonight if you want, like after the break, Larry. Yeah. Two in front of you. We could calculate that for you. Well, excuse me. You have two people in front of you. Uh, I'm next, and then uh, Millie. Uh, kind of, uh, kind of uh, like what uh, Mr. Whitney was saying. I'd, I'd be very interested to see, you know, different gradations there, and everything like that. And then, along with what uh, Member Berger said, uh, I, I, w I was kind of uh, curious at your comment that um, you know it's only it's only two hundred ten thousand dollars. I mean, good night. That sounds to me like it's a third of the way there. I mean, if that if that were to be imposed, and then you know looking at well the average person, and I realize uh, folks that have rental properties and everything are impacted very differently than just uh, you know us average homeowners. Uh, but for each one to go up, you know, an average of 40 some odd dollars, uh, I mean, if it came to that, so to speak, I, I mean, my opinion is that's, that's not horrible, you know, and it, and it does, I mean, a third of the way there is, is, is big, I think. Uh, and Millie. Um, I just wanted to say real quick to Larry's point or question. That could be one of our recommendations, perhaps, that there not be a cap on the millage rate that we do uh, that as part of this workshop. Or am I not thinking about that in the right way? And the second thing was, um, um, do you have any sort of list, or could you get something together about revenue sources or streams that have already been considered and rejected for whatever reason so we don't spend our bills on stuff that just can't happen? Or I'm thinking like about saying that, in yeah. the last, you know, year or so, stuff that's already been, you know, brought up and considered. What, what are we working against that's already been? Mm -hmm. Like, what's out of the box? I don't know what's in the box. Mm -hmm. I, I may have to think about that and get back to you on it. Um, I, just offhand, just real offhand, I can't think of anything in particular that, that has been like, like fully vetted and thought about as a new revenue stream, you know, like it went to council or anything like that. But, but I am speaking on off the cuff, so let me let me think about that. And, and my understanding is that you're looking for new sources of continuous stream, not just a one-off fundraising. Yeah, type of that that would be ideal, obviously, for the, the future. Yeah, okay. for sure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Schler and then Mr. Whitney. Uh, I just wanted to clarify the, the utility tax and this waste management fee, those are targeted for the general fund? The current utility tax, all this in the general fund? The utility tax increase would actually go into our capital assets fund, but the waste management would be going into the general fund. And that's, okay. And the stormwater report would go into the and we can just maybe group them more together so that when you say, oh, that's only 200,000, but there's also this other 200,000 that we're going to add. Yeah, and I, that's my mistake, because I think about the capital assets and the general fund sort of together because so often the general fund has to subsidize the uh, capital assets fund because the utility tax does not brought in enough revenue to fully do the. Right, so the stormwater is in the middle of that, I'm just saying. Yeah, it's just a good point. Is that makes sense. Specific, yeah. Targeted audience and also as a specific collection. So yeah, that's a good point. And, I, and I'll just make a comment. I guess, gosh, everyone wants to raise taxes, <laughs> but me. Mr. Whitney. Uh, yeah, I don't like responding to that. I, to me, this exercise is not about whether somebody wants to raise or lower taxes. This is about exposing everything. And then understanding the later understanding the implications of such an action. Okay, we may say that, for argument's sake, uh, raising it to 8.7 would bring us all the money in the world, but it might have a direct impact on people's ability to buy goods and services. 
So, and then maybe we would say that that's not a good number. But I think it's important that we lay all of these things out all the way and be able to critically analyze them without a passion for whether you want to raise taxes or lower taxes to see what the value of that is. Okay? That's my response to that. My question here is yeah, I got her. on the all satellite beach and the assessed value, is that based on current value or projected value for the next cycle? Based upon oh. what was assessed for last year. The, the most current data I have in the property traders office. Okay. Are, are we not expecting an increase? We are expecting an increase. Can, can you put a line also in here that says anticipated increase so you can have the difference with and without the anticipated increase? Yeah, I can do it on this spreadsheet as well. We had included that on the five-year forecast one, but I can put it on this one as well. Okay, because we want to get, we want to close that $600,000 nut for the cycle that we're referring to, and it's not necessarily germane to the five-year deal. Yeah, I, I understand. For this conversation. Yeah. We can have that, yeah. Okay. Uh, Vice Chair Rickard? Um, yeah, just in general comment, I, I think in regard to the taxes and everything, I, I just, for time's sake, it, to me, the way this process seems is, is that, uh, you know, the staff has come forward with, you know, some, you know, middle of the road guidelines, and we will have the ability to say if we can lower it or raise it, but maybe it just seems like we're asking a lot of questions, and maybe once you guys get through, all the revenue sources will be able to better understand. Because I just, you know, this is what you do all day, right? Brittany is, is crunching these numbers, and to me, it seems like this is kind of a middle of the road scenario. Instead of having 10 scenarios, yeah, I mean, we could have a lot more paper in front of us, but <laughs> it, it seems like this is a middle of the road, and we'll still have the opportunity to say we don't want to raise the rate or raise it even higher. So I just, I just think we're, at, we're all enthusiastic and asking some good questions, but maybe some of these will get answered as you guys get through. Member Sims? Yes. Can no, you have I, your... You didn't get the... Well, I just wanted to make sure. Well, Thanks. I mean, I can respond as well to a sweeping statement. I was just ask who everyone is, but I mean, you know, it's a little snarky. So that's... Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so nobody saw me, but I put my hand up too in the middle. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, I, I have one comment and one question. Uh, uh, my question is, and this is kind of in line with uh, something Mr. Schler was asking a few minutes ago, uh, I guess, um, but the, the, uh, the $600,000 deficit, so to speak, and I don't know if that's the correct term or not, but the $600,000 deficit uh, is kind of generalized because it's just revenues that we're not going to have, that we have been having, and it affects many things across the board. And, and I'm just kind of putting out what I think I'm supposed to understand, and I'm looking to be corrected if, if not. Um, and what we're looking at here are uh, differences in, uh, we're looking at increases possible, you know, uh, possible increases in revenues uh, coming from different areas, like there's the stormwater uh, fees that can be raised, and the utility tax, and uh, water tax, and things. Um, you know, also the ad valorem, and you know, I'm just looking on the sheet here, and there's a $210,000 difference, and then uh, I mean, a possible $210,000 difference, a possible $484,000 difference, and a possible $204,000 difference, and any or any combination of those things are possible scenarios to make up the total 600. Do I understand that correctly? No, to Andrew's point, it would have been better if we isolated the stormwater piece of this for starters because the second table there that is the stormwater table, that $484,000 goes into a separate fund just for stormwater purposes. Okay. $600,000 number we're talking about affects general fund revenue. So the two things on this sheet that apply directly to that are the $210,000 under the ad valorem and the $204,000 under the utility tax. Is that right? 
generally speaking? What do you want to, what do you want to say? Well, I just want to be careful with the 204 because it, it really does go into a different fund. We do transfer money back and forth. But when we talk about the expenditures that are on your five-year forecast for general fund, this doesn't include any capital assets expenses. This okay. just includes general fund expenses. So in, in my head, I look at it as it's just the 210 to offset the expenses that we have strictly in general fund. You know, and does the... Yeah, and the waste management. With the waste management is supposed to bring in an additional $50,000. So you're talking about about $260,000 to come into the general fund to help pay for the general fund expenses as well as try to fill the gap of the $600,000 homestead exemption. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm, I'm beginning to get a better idea. Uh, and I and a comment. Um, I and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm kind of seeing this the you know our second meeting here uh, as you know a lot of this I would regard as something akin to brainstorming, where you know you can freely come out with ideas and you know it's part of the group's responsibility not to you know for nobody to poo poo on anybody else's ideas because that's what we want. We want the door open to yes. any and all ideas. And there's also a big component of education going on, too, to even understand. I mean, from my point of view, anyway, a big component of education to understand just exactly what we're brainstorming on. Agreed. Is that right? That is correct, yeah. All okay. ideas are welcome, and we'll give you as much information as we can so you make you know, educated recommendations. You know. Okay. And for the record, I'm not super keen on raising taxes either, but I recognize that, uh, you know, you can't, you can't pay for things without money. I'll pay the neither are we. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think any, anybody's ever really keen on that. Okay, I guess it's back. Oh, Berger. No, sorry about that. So um, I've got my five-year forecast and the vets. Um, and, again, yeah, I'm the marketing person, not the math person. Okay. So I see, an error, please let me <laughs> um, I see for current mm -hmm. 6.9, mm -hmm. yet when I'm on the five year, it says 7.013. So that 7.013 and your includes that additional 313,000 that we're saying we should see as property taxes increase. So what Larry was talking about, oh, the, tax, okay. the taxable value of okay. the it's already okay. reflected in that okay. five years. Okay, and uh, I didn't follow that, but I do now. So then the other math problem I'm having is I looked at the 210 and the 484 and the 204 and said, wow, but, the, but you just clarified there's only 260 out of that. Yeah, and, and, and so to elaborate on that, so... It was, it was the decision to, to look at all these things because we are all under the understanding that we have an infrastructure issue with the stormwater. We have piping that needs to be replaced. So when it was decided to work out the stormwater master plan to figure out you know, how much would it cost, what needs to be replaced in the city, what was it going to cost, it was then decided to kind of take a look at this too to figure out what could we raise the ERUs to in order to figure out how to cover that cost. So unfortunately, this was kind of like a... Uh, multi funds going on to try to figure out what we need to do in each one of these funds to fix this problem in all the funds that we have and currently tonight we are just really discussing general fund because general fund just has, has the six hundred thousand dollar homestead we're discussing natural alarm taxes and then of course the waste management um so that is correct two hundred sixty thousand dollars is what we're talking about raising revenue to help fill that six hundred thousand dollar hole if if it would make it less Confusing, we can table discussing the stormwater and utility tax, like for now, because the, the revenue line items we're going to go through tonight are all just strictly general funds. If, if that would help, I mean, we can still go through this, but we clearly should have had the fund reference in each of these tables so that would have made it clear which, where that money was going for you all. So I apologize for that, not being clear. Did you have another question? Um, my other question was related to the revenue sources that were proposed or are the increases because um, I think what I remember from one meeting of that prior uh, only covered recreation 
So um, I, uh, what I'm lacking is the perspective of, based on the proposed rates, what's the increase over uh, prior years. And you're talking about just recreation or? Recreation and exactly. all the other stuff, yeah. So the recreation, we're talking about bringing in about an additional $10,000 this year based upon the raises that we increased them by. When we go through the revenue items line, line by line, this is going to be your opportunity to tell us if you think that we should do something different with some of these line items. What you're going to run into with a lot of them is we don't have any control over them. They are state and county. We get a certain percentage. It is what it is. Sometimes we can say that the, the percentage might go up, you know, two and a half or three percent. But the way we budget, we budget for the exact same amount that we had the year before. So that way, if we get any extra, great. Crazy. Right. So, um, so yes, I mean, to your, to your question, we will be going through these line by line, and then you can let us know if you want to look at something a little further. I'll be honest with you, with the recreation fees, we, we looked at what we currently charge, um, and you know, discussed, I, I think a couple of years ago, they raised the tennis courts fees. So we left a few of those alone, then we raised a few of the others. But we didn't want to raise them like crazy. You know, we're, we're doing the best we can to try to make sure that we're not throwing all of this on the citizens. We're trying to proportion it the best way we possibly can, as well as trying to cut things on our end to, you know, to cover this. Nobody else had their hand up yet. <laughs> um, your line by line thing, is that something we had asked to? It was on the website and I just forgot to. It print is, it. but we didn't tell you to print it. If you'd like, I can run those copies off now before, right before we get to it. We can do that. I'll uh, that would be awesome. Okay. Yeah. I'll let you keep going with that and then I'll, I'll okay. print it real quick. Okay. So, which uh -huh. I actually have it in the Adobe. It's already out, so if you just want to print it, it'll print to the Okay, so okay, so we talked about the Aguilar, and we decided we're going to skip over stormwater and capital assets at this point. We'll just strictly stay on the stormwater or on the general fund. So, and I want to go back and apologize. I didn't mean it to sound like it's only just two hundred thousand dollars. I wanted it to make it to more about the fact that we're trying not to push all of it on to the citizens. And so we're doing the best we can to kind of balance that out. And that's what you all are here for, to help us balance that out. So um, down at the bottom is the waste management. So currently, every year um, in June, normally waste management comes up and says, hey, we're going to raise the fee by this much. Um, so right now, the franchise fee is we, the city receives 10% of it. Um, and we're uh, recommending to raise that to 15%. So at the bottom, you're going to see the current monthly rate that, that is paid. The rate that it's going to be going up at 6 1 of 18 that we don't have any control over. That is something waste management says because the contract that we have, they have the ability to raise those fees every year. That's what it's going to go to on 6 1 of 18. And then if we choose to move it from 10%, to 15 percent, um, kind of go all the way to the right if you want to. You'll see the annual difference for residential and multifamily. And then commercial obviously depends on um, the kind of yardage they have and how many times it's picked up. Uh, yes. Um, I just have a question uh, regarding the franchise fee. When you say that we're considering raising the franchise fee from 10% to 15%, is that, I mean, this, does the city operate as a franchisee to waste management? And they, I mean, I, I guess I didn't understand that. Does, does waste management pay a percentage of those fees back to the city? They, yes. They and we're looking to possibly renegotiate that deal with them to have them pay us more or... We're that, just yes, flat out allowed correct. to charge them more if we want? There is a cap at 15%. Currently, it's a 10% was where it currently is. We're requesting to go to 15%, which would then mean waste management would be giving us that additional money. And then they're, but they're free but to they're raise the rates on everybody, and exactly. it's reasonable to assume they'll raise the rates on everybody by that additional 5%. 
to cover that for themselves? That's what's down here, what I... is if we were to raise it, you will see the difference. So for a residential, what you will see on your bill is an additional $15 a year to go from that 10 to the 15. Okay. Including, <clears throat> sorry, including the increase that's already going into effect on six. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I was just saying, maybe what Jeff was saying is, are they going to, you know, see that, you know, the 15% and then tack on even more because... Yeah, that was my question. I mean, that seems like the, unless they're not allowed to do that, that seems natural. These rates come from them. We've had the discussion with them and said we would like to move it from 10 to 15. What will the rates be if we do that? Oh, okay. These rates come from them. Mr. Schler? Um, uh, first, I guess in my perception, um, I think this is the service that most people here appreciate the most. Um, I, there's a lot of comments I always hear from people as well. You put anything down at the end of the street, and boy, it disappears right in. So I think we like waste management. Um, they are offering to increase it at an incremental amount. Anyway, right? You're saying in the first three columns? Yes, every year they have the option of, at June 1st okay. to raise it, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Again, it just seems like we're just nickel and diming to try to collect a little bit more revenue. So, uh, again, the same objection I have about <laughs> increasing the rates. Although this is, this is a, a good service, I think, right? I, I would not disagree. And, and to, to answer that question about nickel and dining things, when we go through these revenue items, we don't have a lot of choices of where we can raise until you do these little things. Because like I said, waste management can only go up to 15% for the franchise fee. We can't go any higher. Ad valorem can only go up to 10 mils. We're at 8.15. We can't go any higher than 10. So there are caps that we have to, to follow through. So then the other revenue items that you look at are the things that are state and county that give us a piece of it. So we don't have any choice to try to raise those. And so then the other step that we have are the actual charges for the services where, you know, the recreation comes into play, the fire inspections come into play, um, the court fines, the parking fines, um, ordinance violations. Those would be the only other little things. And, and you don't want to take an ordinance violation that's $25 and say the next time you get that it's going to be 250 You know what I mean? Like we're trying to do the best we can to, to raise things incrementally that will always continue to be an additional revenue source. Right, right, right. And, and, wait, and the contract with waste management, um, uh, we don't have to hit the max, right? And they, uh, they raise it, it's like cost of living raises every year. And I'm happy with that, I guess I can say. Okay. Um, and, and other than that, we should control our spending. Larry, Whitney. Uh, this, this whole, I kind of knew it, but now I'm really learning it. The, this waste management thing is, seems weird to me. It seems like we're almost, the, the city almost has an incentive to get them to raise the rate so that the, the, the rate, the, the amount of money coming back is greater. And that puts the incentives in the wrong places. Okay? If, if I'm waste management and you're the city and you need more money, you can get me to raise my, I come to you and say I need to raise it by 1% and you say raise it by 3% and that way I have to raise my thing to 15% and get the money I need. So Am I misreading that? Is that the way to work? I, I understand your point. The math would work out like that. The math right? works out like yeah. that. So the, the incentives are incorrect. It doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, so just so you know, the way the contract is actually structured is what you're seeing in that table there that's, that's basically laid out. But the, the franchise is granted to waste management. They're the provider. The only provider in the city for these types of services. That's why we, the city, are charging them the franchise fee. But contractually, it's a 10-year contract, and they specifically have language in there that allows them every year to come and request, and it's granted because it's contractually based, um, to come in request an increase for CPI, uh, Consumer Price Index, well, right, and well, fuel. Cool. 
It's the two, right. And they use CPI to drive code. Right. They look at CPI and tool and those two things and do a calculation. And they send a le uh, letter to the city every year and say, this is our our increase based on the contract. And that's that's the contract that's in place. You know, so you're, you're right. I mean, that is, that is how the contract is structured. So, so the 15% to me is, is I don't want to understate it, but it's not material. What's, what's material is once you set that rate, your incentive to give that increase is because that way you're getting a backdoor tax on the community. That money's going to work. It's going to general fund. Absolutely. That's, that's a sneaky part of the military. I understand your point. I mean, the way the way it's structured is really so that the city gets revenue for allowing one provider to be there. I mean, instead of it being just like a free for all, so one block could have this provider and one block could have that. You know, that's that's the way it's structured. So I, I get your point, Larry. I, mean, I have no no argument with that. I mean, I wouldn't want different vendors on different streets. So I can understand that, but I don't understand the French. Franchise. No, you're right, because it's, 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 it's not saying, okay, you, the provider, pay us for allowing you to be the sole source provider because we went through the bid process and all that. But the math is still there that every time the rates go up, it's the residents who are indeed paying that. And it's not that process, it's the source of the revenue. The source is coming from the home owner. Yeah, I understand. And I would. That's the thing. Yeah, I mean, fundamentally, I would say that all of these, there are, there are a handful of things in here that are specific revenues that are coming from only the users and not everybody's a user. But outside of that, most of these things are gonna come from the majority of the residents. I mean, utility tax is on the water. I mean, there are maybe a handful of people that you know, don't pay that directly, but somehow indirectly, maybe if you're rent or something, they're paying for that. So yeah, all of these, they may not be in the form of valorum, but they're, other than recreation fees, the things that we've talked about so far, most of them are just borne by people who are in the city or property owners in the city. The end user yeah. always pays for everything. I right. have no, no yeah. problem with that. The, the, generally speaking, we, we impose things like taxes because everybody utilizes the same amount of services from those taxes, generally. They all enjoy it at the same rate. We have fees because we're targeting different people that have different needs and let them pay for that particular thing and you don't need to spread that across the thing. I don't know too many people who sell like these that don't have their trash picked up. So I don't understand that why that's not part of the mill rate and, and get rid of this, other than this, that's a mechanism for the city to help manage keeping the mill rate down and you got this secret money funneling back in that's still coming out of the same source. Well, I'll tell you, if you, if you I mean, I, I wouldn't call it secret, but it's only because I know about well, it. Well, you know, it's I, I don't mean literally it's secret. It's just it's, a little yeah. backdoor thing. I'll tell you that some places put the, the, the cost or the assessment for the trash pickup on the tax bill. They put it as ad valorem instead of not ad valorem. Yeah, so and you could wrap it up in ad valorem by your tax rate going up. You mm -hmm. could also have a separate assessment. Like, you can do a separate assessment. Some places do it for fire. Some places can do it just for trash pickup. I mean, it can be on your tax bill. So it's even more obvious than out there, I guess, if that's your concern. I mean, it's it's a proposal that could be brought up. <laughs> if you want to go it, there. It's just something that caught my yeah, attention. I understand your point. I apologize for uh, digressing, but... Sorry. Mr. Schler? Um, just a, a question on with the waste management contract. I, I think I heard you say that during the storms when there was that month of debris pickup, yard waste and things, did we pay extra for that? We yeah. had hired as contractors ourselves to pick that up. How come waste management did step up to? Well, contractually, that's not part of their contract because they don't actually have the type of debris truck like you see come around. The clause. So the ones that come around on your normal trash pickup day are through a subcontractor, a waste management does Connor. So it's not not actually um, debris pickup after storms is specifically excluded from the contract because they don't have the capacity or capability to do it on their own. And we, we paid for that extra clean up out of waste contract to get that many you said that you know, yeah. yeah. That was part of what you wanted to the savings to deal with that. To, to re replenish the reserves because of the expenditures, for sure. Yeah. Now, as I recall, uh, um, some of the, and I don't remember which, but some council meetings or something like that, where that very issue was being talked about, 
that was part of what um, played into applying for money from FEMA as well, wasn't it? The, yeah, I, remember, I remember talking about, okay, well, are we going to wait for the FEMA money to get the stuff off the street and then pile it up down at the, you know, at the end of DeSoto, or are we going to get it out of the way now and then wait for FEMA to pay us back later? Is yeah, that right? I um, don't remember the exact conversation, but the way the FEMA money works is after you've expended the money, you can apply it for those reimbursement dollars to okay. the federal government. Um, so I think what you might be referring to is a conversation we had um, particularly after the first storm, but also part of the second storm, which is we have an interlocal agreement with Brevard County to do the debris pickup for us. It doesn't mean they pay for it. We still pay for it, but they would, they had done a, a request for proposals. They had hired contractors to come in and do the, the cleanup for us. And, and other cities have these interlocal agreements. It's just basically an arrangement to say, okay, the storm has happened. Please come in and take care of this for us. The short end of the story is that um, the county could not get enough contractors in under their contract to do the job in an expeditious amount of time. I mean, it was, we had like one truck limping through the city, and you know, obviously the process is they pick up as much as they can, then they have to go off to wherever the, the dump site is. In this case, we made it as easy as possible for them by making the soda far. They wouldn't have to go too far. But bottom line is that wasn't working too well, so we ended up hiring a landscape contractor, a lot of big trucks, to come in and finish the job. And we put our public works crews on the road as much as the, the limited equipment we had. And together, the three-pronged approach is what we ended up having um, basically in both forms to try to get it done faster. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, I guess what I was really driving at was, uh, you know, is that something that, that typically we would we would get paid back for somehow from FEMA? I mean, because yeah, it's so emergency it's, type of stuff? Well. Yes, I mean, we, we hope that FEMA doesn't... We just don't have it yet, debris. still. Right, we got our, um, we get debris, we, we have half of our debris cleanup costs have been reimbursed by FEMA, like we got the cash. For, for Matthew. Matthew, for Matthew. For Matthew. right. For Matthew. And I think total, um, we submitted maybe $300,000 worth of expenses to FEMA for Matthew, and we've received 160 ish 160000 or so, so far, still waiting on the last bit. Irma, uh, you know, the ball, ballpark again was like 300 something thousand again, but we have not received anything from that one yet, so I don't know when it's going to come. You know, it's helpful when it gets Absolutely. Yeah, and our commitment is to put those into reserves because that's where it needs to go. It helps for future hurricanes. So. And then one more question, uh, and I don't know if maybe I'm just getting ahead of us where we are now, um, but has the city considered. Um, I mean, just completely, you know, completely different sources of revenue. I mean, like events and things. Like you see, uh, you see some small towns holding like fall festivals and things like that. I mean, is that is that just like pie in the sky? I know, yeah, that's fun, but it doesn't really raise that much money. I'm sure it's something that you know about in terms of how much money that type of thing actually does raise. Well, for that specific question, I mean, we can ask. Kathy, since she's the rector, director, to talk okay. about that particular scenario. Events like that take a lot of staff time, and we we honestly don't have the staff to handle the big events like that. And those type of events have a lot of costs besides staff time. That the, the revenue for it is just wouldn't make up for it. I mean, unless you're charging a vendor four hundred dollars to come be a vendor, and those aren't the kind of businesses that that tend to. And what about the, uh, I mean, like I see at, at Holy Name of Jesus, they have that fall and haven't been involved in there when, when we went to Boy Scouts there. Um, I'm under the impression that it's, a, that it's a really big fundraiser for them annually, and maybe it's not, you know, millions and millions, but what we're talking about is ultimately less than one million. We're talking about, you know, making up 600,000 in, in pieces. I mean, I'm, I'm not surely they're not losing money on that every year. They wouldn't keep doing it. Yeah, well, the other example that comes to mind is Founders Day that the, the Sally Beach Women's Club puts, puts on every year. I mean, I, I don't know the details, but they make a pretty good amount of money, right? It's, I, I don't know yeah. the math on it. Yeah. 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 Awesome, but I guess if what you're saying is you guys, that would be one of your proposals for us to look at other types of recreational events where we could potentially, if the numbers work, you know, doesn't, if we make more than we spend on it, I mean, those are certain things we can look at. 
I, I hesitate to add events because, I mean, have you seen how many events go on <laughs> on, a, on a weekend? There can be eight big things going on just each side. I need that to, to 192 in one weekend. And spring and fall are just absolutely loaded. I work every single Saturday in those seasons already on events that we're doing. Yeah. So to just throw another thing out there that's just going to split the, the number of people that are going to these things even more, I don't think if there was a need for something for an event like that, I can see. Well, I'm not referring to, that's just the one thing that comes to mind. I mean, not being really, you know, schooled in that type of stuff. Uh, but, I'm, you know, uh, you know, if those events, if there's, you know, that many of those type of events, someone's making money on them or they, I mean, they would not be doing it. Yeah. Well, and, and I know part of your question was really just, are there other things? That was an example. Yeah, know. yeah. Truly... You know, I, I mean, what we're looking at so far are existing uh, revenue streams and figuring out how to how to improve on that, how to increase those. And I wonder if there are revenue streams that we just have, you know, that we haven't considered. Well, I, that's part of why we're here because, like, I struggle with trying to think of things that are maybe out of the box or creative or things that we haven't come across before. I mean, I, I hear what other cities do sometimes. Special events is a good example, and you know, I see there's a potential there. What I what I've struggled with here is. The only land I think is big enough to do something really big is that 100 acres. You know, that's just available and like for parking and everything. Sure. Else. I picture a big fair. Not that that's a good example. Um, I mean, we could look at to see what the math would work out to be if number one we could actually get access to using that facility, that, that land that's not ours. Um, and I'm sure the owners would want to cut a, a cut of whatever the revenue is, you would think. Um, but anyway, I mean, those are things that if you if you want us to look at, we can certainly see if it's there, and it would be an outsourcing of like the staffing and things. Because to Kathy's point, we couldn't manage something like that. So you'd have to hire a company to do this, so yeah. they could promote it, you know, get revenue off of it. They make some money, the city makes some money. I have no idea what that looks like because I've never looked at it before. Um, but but just big picture beyond just recreational events, that's the kind of stuff we're looking for ideas on because you know. Every day I try to think of something that we can do, but I haven't come across anything that's like a gold mine or a series of gold mines that I can put together to make, you know, a good, good case. Um, but well, I love it, so. well, in smaller events, uh, I mean, events in general that, that drive revenue don't have to be, you know, big, giant gold mines, you know, that, that entail a lot of risk and everything like that, too. But, uh, you know, we're talking about a really long haul here. And maybe we, you know, begin to pick up some smaller things that that aren't as much of a burden on, you know, city staff and everything like that, but do but do drive some revenues. And I I think that kind of stuff tends to grow over time. Um, Ms. Sims, next. Um, to that point, um, do you know how much was earned at the last um, relief or that you had? Because that's a big deal, like cancer. Yeah, that's, well, not, that's, that's not a city of that. City doesn't make any money off of that. Oh, no, 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 I'm asking how much was generated by the people that came out and supported that, because that's a big event, and so that would give me an idea. The how day of, because, it, I mean, the fundraising for that, for this area has been going on, then Relay for Life ended last year. Well, I heard in a meeting, and that's so what my question is for, is, did I hear correctly that since 2015, it's raised a total of 30000 that's like that's within two years or three years? Um, so let's see. I've been involved for three years here. I think the first year was somewhere in the $30,000 range. Second year was 40000 This past year, they, they just, we just got over $50,000. That's what I was saying. Okay. But I think that's that's more, more, that seems really low for this many people. Yeah, well, before, people. I believe before the day of the event on Saturday, I think we're in the 40s. Six or forty-seven thousand dollars. So you know, but that's you know, I don't know how that works. But anyway, yeah. so um, okay, I just wanted to get an idea of what well, a lot of money is. Keep in mind too that that's a, that's a charitable. There's, there's yeah, a charitable yeah. time, yeah. and a lot of the events that we're involved with have um, a local um, group like the Women's Club or the Lions Club. So so the city's not bringing in income. We're helping those clubs raise money for their you know, what they do in the community. Right. Um, and so if the city chose to take on, a, on an event to fundraise, mm -hmm. you're going to have a hard time 
finding people that are like, yeah, I'll contribute to the city when you're already in the city. You know, when we don't have that, that terrible, you know, good feeling thing, it's, it's hard to turn it on. I mean, yeah, in a fundraising type. Yeah, scenario. the kind of thing I think about that this is a big thing would be like if we identify, you know, like there's the Melbourne Art Festival. If there's something that we became identified as, you know, yes, like the, something that fits image, that fits image, our yeah. city's personality. Yeah. That brings in a lot of money that people like, like the Beer and Wine Festival, or so. I mean, yeah, whatever. Um, well, I would say Ocean Breeze Beach is, right. is kind of one of those signature things that's true. for our area. Yeah. But again, that's a, that's another group that comes in that the city waves you know, fees for them to put on that event as part of it. Yeah. And we don't, we lose money on that because we have to get the yeah. staff working on it. There's um, police officers crossing people across the street. Well, I, I do make sure it makes the record. How do you make money out of events like that, right? I guess, I mean, if we would have bike week here or something, how do you make money out of that? Because we don't currently charge taxes on retail sales or anything in the city, right? Which I would never suggest. But, I mean, here, but it's a great idea. It's a great idea. It sounds fantastic to yeah. bring out some kind of festival here to bring some income into the area and revitalize this. Area, right? yeah. And maybe all our assessed property values will go up. And that's how we make the money, right? Yeah, it's over, it's over a long haul. Right, right. right. Yeah. Let's improve the value of our city. Yeah. Records? Yeah. <clears throat> I was just going to ask more what are some of those things that are happening? that the city staff is involved in because you know, I'm a big supporter of charities, but mm -hmm. if if our city staff is dedicated to helping charities and we're not taking in any revenue, you know, I, I guess it, I, I like these ideas of festivals and additional mm -hmm. revenue also, but like the Founders Day, for example, you know, if that's a if the city staff is helping out but we don't collect any of the benefit you know, is it something we cut back on or share? I, I, again, I support no, charities. I, I, I just, I you know, totally the city shouldn't be, you know, handing out. Oh, maybe you should not do this. And I can, I can provide, yeah, when we do our, our rec presentation, I can provide you guys a list of the events and stuff that we're Perfect. doing, what groups we're working with for that. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly a potential revenue source, right? I mean, not exactly where I was going to work in the West. You know, mm -hmm. is there an opportunity? I mean, I, I want to see charities obviously do the things that they do, but can, can we strike a balance that there's something we receive for the effort mm -hmm. that we put into it? Maybe it's possible to um, uh, have events that, um, you know, that are hosted by the city and that's a city, you know, that drives some revenues to the city, uh, you know, from participants and whatnot, but the charitable organizations are allowed to participate in those things in the same way and don't have to pay those fees. Something to look at, yeah. I've it. From, from, a, from a financial and budgeting standpoint, whether it's a good idea or not a good idea is, is neutral to me. What I'm looking at is, I don't know, if, even if we all said, yes, let's do this, I don't know how you plug that into a budget to close a gap. Yeah, we, we Unless have you have three years' experience, you can't put a number in there. Or you have to, you can put a general line on it, but it's a zero. Right. And if you end up making money, so do you, but if you don't. Well, the place that comes to mind for me to start on that, Larry, and it's a good point, is like, to look at all the events that we where we partner and we don't charge something. Like that's a quick number we can pull together. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can probably easily get information from other cities that have like these big events. Mm -hmm. And just get sort of like, because they're going to have a budget and we'll be able to see, you know, what it costs them to do it. You know, just for some context. Because that no, happen to no like question, that. but again, that's yeah. about getting information in order to understand how you can build it yeah. into a yeah. predictable plan. Exactly. And see if it's worth discussing. From a quite strictly from a financial perspective, not yeah. from a social perspective. Yeah, it's $500 a year. I mean, you don't need to talk about it for very long, I guess. Mr. Schler. Berger. A different topic. So I've seen some of the, um, uh, I don't know 
what you call them, the infrastructure that's going on in A1A to uh, reduce the medians, and I see signs that are covered, which also seem like they may be an attempt to control speed. Where do, if there are speed violation collections, because I would assume that there may be an uptick if there's an enforcement, what is that? That's in the line item uh, revenue we'll get into. There's a, it's a line item called court fines and forfeits. Okay. I would just go on record as uh, a person who lives on Jamaica Boulevard that I think it would be just quite all right for the police to start handing out a lot more speeding tickets. Okay. Just say it. <laughs> well, without being called on first, I would suggest that if they gave out speeding tickets, we wouldn't have the lower in taxes. <laughs> on, on my street alone, they did. Nobody does less than 50 miles an hour. You could stop every single car and give them a ticket. That's something to think about. It's true. Mm -hmm. I wrote that one down too. All right. Where do we look? I think, it's back, I think it's back to you two. I think uh, we discussed the algorithm. We discussed the waste management. Are we uh, want to move past that and move on to... Um, the line items of the revenue. Sure. Are we get to do that. We can cover on the second page. Do you want to cover that? Oh. Alright, so let me pull that up. Can we pull up the screen too? It's so small on your own. Well, why is it going to that? Can I just ask? So the second page of this thing that we've been looking at, mm -hmm. you've actually done the calculations to say based on X values and these proposed increases. Yeah. This, this is what we're looking at in terms of additional. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the documents that I gave you. Um, I pulled the property up to kind of show you if we raise the millage rate to an 8.4, what this specific property would be paying additionally, and then once the homestead exemption was passed, what the specific, specific property owner would be saving um, based upon based upon the assessed value at this point. I understand that assessed value could go up because this specific property would not get the full $25,000 exemption because their assessed value is only at $118,150. So they get the first $50,000 from the first two homestead exemptions and then they would only get the $18,150 additionally because they don't get their properties off the full $125,000. And maybe I should stop here for just a second because I want to make sure that we all understand how this homestead exemption works how you get them. Um, should we should we go through that? Like that would be a good idea. Okay. Yeah. Okay, perfect. I was I was wondering because I, I'll be honest with you, personally, until I got involved with the city, um, understanding that homestead exemption can sometimes be complicated. Um, I'll be honest with you when they when they released this other one, it took it took a lot of thinking through the whole entire thing to understand how this would play out. So for starters, um, there are a lot of exemptions that you can have with property taxes. They're on the property tax appraiser's uh, website um, for, for all kinds of things. In order to get those exemptions, you apply to the property appraiser's office to get them. Um, you have to own the property, and you, that property has to be your permanent residence. I'm not sure if there's much more to get the homestead exemptions at least. So, the first homestead exemption was exempted from property values from $0 to 25000 The second property uh, homestead exemption was from 50000 to 75000 This third one is going to be from 100000 to 125000 So the question is, what the heck does that mean? Because to me, it was like, uh, okay, so doing some research, if your property was valued at $125,000, it was assessed at $125,000. I want to make sure I use the right terms here. If your property was assessed at $125,000 and this new homestead exemption gets passed, you would receive a $75,000 exemption because you qualified for the first one because your house was over $25,000. You qualified for the second one because your house was over $75,000. And now you're going to qualify for the third one because your house is over $125,000. 
Now, let's say your house is assessed at 124,000. The way this would work is instead of you would get the first 25, the second 25, but because you were below the 125 and at 124, you're only going to get $24,000 of that exemption. So you would get a $74,000 exemption instead of a 75. Does that make sense? Sure. <laughs> sort of like sort of like the margins on your income taxes. So, yes. Uh, are, there, are there homes in satellite beach that are not assessed at less than 125,000? That are assessed less than 125,000? Is that what you said? Was yes. Uh, this one that I provided you is a perfect example. This one is assessed at 185. Oh, right. To save our homes. Right. Okay. right. So if it's assessed at less than 125,000, Whatever it is between 100 and 125, that's what you would get. So if you were assessed at 110, you'd only get $10,000 on top of your 50. So I guess the other side of that question then is how many mm -hmm. are above <laughs> it's, that will be eligible. That's how you came to the $600,000. Yeah. Yeah. You did that that's, calculation. Yes, yeah. that is where it came into play with the, because I, I did, I pulled down from the tax collector's office every single property in the city. And I looked at every single one because obviously you have properties that don't pay any taxes at all. You have properties that um, have some have exemptions, some do not. So I had to go through and, and divvy it all out and figure out which ones, and then go through the ones that were between that 100 and 125 and figure out how much of those would they actually be exempt from. So, and that is correct. That's how we got to the $600,000 number. So in the end, we're just raising, you're proposing to raise taxes on almost everyone then, because not everyone will be eligible for this additional exemption that is because of these capped house growth values and all the way this all works, right? That is the <laughs> point that the Florida League of Cities has been trying to explain to everyone that this is not a tax deduction for everyone. It is a tax shift. You are going to be saving money on a property that gets the full exemptions, and those who don't get it are going to have to pay more. Right. So it's just a tax shift. But, you know, if, if, if the homestead exemption doesn't pass, I think it will be like a once in a lifetime. I mean, I have never seen any place where a homestead exemption doesn't pass. Most, most of the voters probably don't understand the five points of which, that you're going Which is what I tried to explain when we were discussing this in our council meeting, was to try to get people to understand that. But that is correct, because even if you only get an additional 10000 because your house is assessed at 110, why would you not vote for it? <coughs> you know what I mean? Right. People who have rental properties, they most likely have a home in this city, so they're going to get the homestead exemption on their property, so why not vote for it? Because otherwise you're not even getting it on your own home property. You know what I mean? So, and even though it will increase the taxes on the rental property, it will. Yes, it will. I, I don't disagree with that. I mean, and that's that's the part of this tax shift here. So, right. So I guess uh, I just reiterate what I said before. I'm sorry if I'm just no. You can I object to the philosophy of saying, well, let's just incrementally raise the taxes because it's relatively harmless to most people, right? And, and it gets us part of the way to keeping our costs ever increasing in our budget as we spend money, like on solar panels and things like that, and that don't materially increase the value. Yes, I, I understand your point. <laughs> okay. Thank you. The only statement I think I would Sorry. make about, about all of this is that we wouldn't be talking about raising the military had the state not said we're going to put a homestead exemption. Had the state not changed the mortality rates for the pension. Had the state not done this or had the state not done that. Like, these are things that we have to do because we're being told this is what you're going to have to do. Like, figure it out. And so that, that's where this, this Citizens Budget Committee came into play because it was we need the guidance from the citizens to tell us and help us figure out what the best solution is because we don't have any control over what the state does. And honestly, we're going to talk about some of these line items where the state is talking about cutting more. Um, and we're going, to, we're going to go into that, discuss that more. So, do you have another comment? No, that's great. I'm going to go into that. Because it, it makes me curious about if the state is increasing, you know, insurance premiums or something that, you know, I'm sure we have to deal with that. But we'll see what yeah. the impact is. Any others? City 
that that helped understand the second page a little better. <laughs> um, yes, okay. uh, except at the top, so single family residents assess that 176 taxable value, 126. Isn't it missing the 25, the next $25,000 deduction that's coming in? So there's not any houses that low value left. So these, I think these numbers, you correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the titles there, to, to clarify, they would already, the assessed value, the actual calculation has already been done to get to your taxable value with the new homestead exemption. Oh, okay. Thank you. It's just that column isn't there. Thank right. you. All right. Got it now. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. And these are actual homes in the city. These actually are, um, the council gave the staff the approval to take their addresses and use them to kind of help. So that's what these are. Um, their addresses are on here? No, no, we just put the, um, we use their value. Wanted to home. use a single family, show you a single family residence in a town home, and then I had, because um, one of the things obviously we wanted to see what it would do to a commercial property, because they don't have exemptions. And so I had picked two commercial properties that are well known in the city and are not huge franchises, I guess, you know, because the Walgreens and the public are they'll probably be able to figure it out with all of the different buildings they have, but the smaller ones that are family owned and things like that, we wanted to be able to show uh, the impact on those. Uh, so your townhouse, your townhouse represents a rental property where there are no exemptions, I guess. And your example there in the flip end is the with commercial, I guess, right? So the commercials do not have any exemptions. The, the ones above those all do. The difference between the assessed value and the taxable value is your exemptions. But the townhouse has the same assessed and taxable. Third one from the bottom. It was assumed to be like an investment property. I am sorry. I apologize. I was looking at the second one. Yes, that townhouse specifically did not have any exemptions. Right. Yes. Good examples, just again. <laughs> Are we good with this document? Okay. Then let's go to the revenue um, list. <coughs> and before we start, I want to just point out that this is the entire year's worth of revenue for the past fiscal year, 16, 2016, 2017. We did this because we want to give you a full year's look. We can also give you where we're at this year currently, but it just seems to be less of a good picture to show you. This is all last year, so there will be a few times where you'll see some things we might mention. Well, that relates to the hurricanes, so those are runoffs or whatever, more on the expenditure side, but we'll get to that. So just to kind of explain this so um, you all understand how this works, the original budget column is when we put the adopted budget together in September, that's going to be that column. Six months into it, and we're going to be doing this in June, um, we make an amendment to the budget. Uh, increase, decrease, depending on how things are growing, we take from one line item to another line item, et cetera, et cetera. That is gonna be your amended budget column. Then you have your year-to-date actuals, and then the columns to the, re the rest of them to your right hand side I would not be concerned with because they just, you know, they tell you the percentage of the budget which you could look at the current month is kind of irrelevant. I mean, all we really care about at this point was the year-to-date actual and did it actually come into in within the budget. Your year to date actual represents the whole year. That is correct, sir. So that's, I think, really the column we're going to mostly mm -hmm. go through. I just wanted to be able to explain because knowing the difference between the original budget and the, amend and the amended budget, I want to make sure everybody understood that. So, all right, so I think we've covered the Admiral Lauren revenue at line item. I think we all understand how that comes in. Um, your share of local option gas tax, that is a, uh, a county and state distribution. It is decided upon, um, obviously it's when you purchase gas and there are pieces of it that come into the state that gets trickled down to the county and then the county trickles it down to the city. So these, um, well, there's a handful of them that normally about July um, get told to us about to estimate what we're going to receive into the next fiscal year. Um, so those numbers will stay 
what I currently have until those new numbers come in and then I'll change them in the budget to what they anticipate to be. But it's normally mid to late July before those numbers get told to us what we should anticipate. The insurance premium tax for both the firefighter pension and the police pension, these are dollars that when um, on your insurance bills, there's a piece of it that goes back, that comes back to the city um, to offset, uh, well, maybe I should re-explain this. Um, they come in to offset the contributions that the city makes to the pension plan. Should I do that? So your, your insurance policies on your homes and properties, there's, home is true. Mm -hmm. okay. there's a line item in there that relates to the insurance premium tax. It's a state required additional fee on every policy. It gets taken by the state and then it gets sent back to um, the cities. And the, the purpose is to use it for the pension plan of your police and firefighters. We currently have an arrangement with the uh, bargaining units for police, and, for police and fire to use these funds to offset the city's required contribution to the pension plan. Some cities haven't negotiated that, so it actually is just like extra money that the pension gets for the, for the employees and it doesn't help the city. In this case, because we bargained with the unions, it helps us. So in other words, if we have to as a city contribute whatever the actuary says every year to the pension plan, if he says contribute $300,000, and we're going to get this money from the state, we can use it to offset our contribution. And those are, again, I keep using 300,000, I'll see my number of the day. But um, <laughs> that's not the real number. So this one uh, yeah. is nothing more than revenue coming in, <coughs> but it has. It's offset by an expense. Yeah, so. It's kind of wash. So if, if the actuary tells me, I mean, not use 300. If he tells me that we need to spend $450,000 one year to fund the pension obligation, if I'm going to get $200,000 in insurance premium tax, then I don't have to take that full amount of general fund revenues because I offset with it. Okay. You partially offset. Partially, yes. Um, partially. Are, are the pension funds fully funded? Based no. on the actual rate? No, but they're at a healthy, um, what's the rate, what's the, uh, the term? Well, what's the they're they're, they're almost know? fully funded. Yeah. They're, they're close to being fully funded. And those are two reports. The reports that we just got um, from the actuary are up on the website for your review as well so that way you can see them. Um, but they are, I want to say like 87, yeah, something like that. 87. Funded. 87% funded. I, I'm, I'm a little confused, I guess. Revenue and expenditure, is that what I'm looking at here? Just revenue. That's what I thought, what are the expenditures then? We're going to revenues first. I see. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I thought I was missing something. No, you're <laughs> good question though. Okay. Yeah, it's right there. Any other questions? Well, but I'm trying to understand the budget, and you're saying that, let's let's just pick anyone here, what solicitors, what well, we'll about alarm permits. Okay. It's originally budgeted that we're going to receive six hundred dollars in alarm mm -hmm. permits, and we're going to spend. We're budgeted to spend that as well. Because so we took in specifically no. that quarter, and we're going to spend it. But year to date, we've only spent three seventy five. So well, what you're looking at currently is strictly just revenues. We anticipate to bring in six hundred dollars in alarm permits. We only brought in three hundred seventy five. I see. Okay. There's nothing in the was, report that you're looking at right now that has the anything cost to do with it. Correct. Okay, right. Correct. So just revenue. Correct. Even though it says revenue and expenditures. That's because the following pages after this are the expenditures. Yes, yeah, sorry. This this report this is like the beginning of the report. It's on the website. And it's like I don't know, 50 pages long or 57. Yeah, pages. I saw. Yeah, yeah. Look at the heading on the report. Yeah, sorry. Ignore <laughs> the second half of the title. I got it. <laughs> just the way it comes off our account. Right. the financial statement, it's 182 pages. That's a fun read up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we didn't go that far into it. <laughs> okay. Communication services. Okay, so communication service tax. That is um, like your internet, your television, cable. There's a fee put on those um, that the city gets a portion of. 
the question I think at hand right now with the state, this is one that is possibly possibility of us losing or losing a portion of it. Um, there is much discussion because now that we have Netflix and Hulu, um, those currently, correct me if I'm wrong, but those currently, there is not a tax on for the city to be receiving. And so the question at hand is, are we going to put a tax on Netflix and Hulu that you pay for every month to give to the city? Because most people are getting rid of their cable um, because they're going to these types of things. And so if they were to decide not to do that, then the communication service tax number will start decreasing a lot because, again, people go to Netflix and Hulu and those types of things. And to clarify, this is, again, something that is governed by the state of Florida. They set the communication service tax. They decide who <coughs> has to pay it in terms of the carriers, and then the carriers pass that along to all of us as we use those services. I think you may, I think you may have just answered a uh, question I was going to ask. Um, when you say, Brittany, when you say, will we put a uh, tax on, uh, you know, on, on uh, Netflix and all that, when you say we, you're talking, we're talking about the state, the state yes. and if the state does implement a tax like that, then a portion of that comes to the city sort of the same way it does now on cable TV? Correct. Okay. Thanks. Is that already? Oh, sorry. Uh, so, yeah, currently, sure. so currently, the communication taxes on telephone, wireless phones, even right, and um, cable TV. That's all right now, right? Although we want to put it on water, we're proposing to put it on water. I think that's all that's on the communication services tax. Mm -hmm. So, the no. internet, so no. things like Netflix, that would be additional income to us if they started doing that. If the that state would be were to put, put, yes, if the state right. were to put it. That way, but are, are you saying that more people are dropping their cable TV, so we're losing that? Or yes, I am saying that more people are dropping their cable and paying for Netflix and Hulu instead. And so, if the state doesn't tax Netflix and Hulu, doesn't tax the internet, then we will be we're losing, losing cable mm -hmm. over time. Right. Yes. Ms. Sims. I just was curious if that fund money or that. Revenue stream is already allocated somewhere else, like the pension fund. So the the general fund revenues that you're seeing here, the total of the revenue from the utility tax that she was just thinking of. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. Added on. Can you ask your question again, Millie? I'm sorry, maybe I misunderstood. Couldn't hear you. Um, the tax that you were just talking about, proposed or perhaps in the future, mm -hmm. if the state decides to tax. Internet services, who, whatever you were just speaking of, right? right? Right. Okay. That additional revenue is that would that already be allocated to something else, or does that go into the general fund? It would go into the general fund. Okay. Yes. And, and the communication services tax line item that we were talking about—that's where that would be shown. Okay. Um, because it would be a potential increase to that line item if the state decided to tax those. Okay. Um, or a decrease if they don't. I'm sorry. So in the communication service tax, it, it's maybe just a matter of semantics, but I want to make sure I'm following it. You mentioned cable, telephone, wireless. Isn't it also ISPs, internet service providers, or isn't there a tax for the internet coming into your home? Because you've got to have internet before you can stream Netflix or Hulu. I don't, I, don't, I don't know about that. I don't think there is because I, I, I recently combined my bills with AT&T and dumped Bright House. And I don't think I ever saw it on a Bright House internet bill. I've never been a cable subscriber. Um, and when it's laid out, the internet is up here and the wireless communication is down here and that's where the service fees are under the wireless communication portion of the bill. So I don't think the internet is taxed. But that's a good question. I don't think it is. I want to follow up. I don't know... 100% certainty to answer that. That's a good question. Yeah, because I mean, the, the size of what you're paying for your internet service is larger than what, you're, what people are paying out for their streaming services. So it, it, that's a potential taxable thing. Um, just curious. Because again, I mean, I don't even look at my bills anymore. You don't know that. Yeah, well, we'll research 
that was that a it's a flat fee or is it a raise? For the community service tax? Yeah. I think it's just it's a it's a percentage based upon whatever the state collects then trickles down to the county and then the county trickles it down to us. Like I think it's based upon the bill. Yeah. The the people that have it in the population of the city. Like I do think it is based upon our city. Is there more information oh. on this and how it's calculated in that um, revenue yeah. document you put out there? Do you know what I don't know Okay. Well, we'll follow up with you on that to make sure we have that explained. There is a document we put out on the website a couple days ago. It's this 100 plus page manual that the state puts together about all the different sources of revenue and how they calculate them and assess them, et cetera. So I'll check there and see if it gives us more details when we do our break. If it doesn't, then we'll just follow up separately. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, it seems to me that these new revenue streams that we're talking about from the state are actually not new revenue streams, they're just replacing revenue streams that are drying up. And that's just to keep the level of revenue continuous. Otherwise, so so those are not revenue opportunities. Those, to me, those are, those are zero. It's going to move from this line to from that line. That's all it is. We are actually coming up on uh, 7.30. Oh, we had one back there, too. <laughs> Sorry. I just noticed we're coming up on 7.30, so if, uh, you know, if we wanted to take a break, is that convenient for you two? Okay. Do you guys like to go ahead and do that? Okay. Go ahead and All right. reconvene. So we have the official big document of all the revenues in the state of Florida that they give us. So here's what it says about communication services tax. I was looking for your answer. Um, it says it applies to telecommunications, video, direct to home satellite, and related services. It encompasses voice, data, audio, video, or any other information or signal transmitted by any medium. Examples include local long distance and pole telephone, voice over internet protocol telephone, video services, video streaming. I'll explain that in a second. Direct to home satellite, mobile communications, private line services, pager and beeper, um, telephone charges made at a hotel or motel, faxes and telex, telegram and teletype. Anyway, it says, and this is where video streaming, like the Netflix that we were talking about, it's not quite there yet because the rule is still that the tax is imposed on retail sales of communication services which originate and terminate in the state or originate or terminate in the state and are billed to an address within the state. But because those providers are outside of Florida, that's why they're not currently included. And um, anyway, the last thing I was just going to say is this document that is online, what it provides up to each of these revenue sources, if it's applicable, is it gives you a table where they forecast that particular revenue source that you can look up by county and you can find our city and you can see what they're saying it will bring in and it tells you the tax rate. Current tax rate on that one for us, it looks like it's 5.22%. So maybe too much information, but it's all there in that, that document if you need it. And those were the tables that I was saying that they will drop in July for the next fiscal year, to give you an idea. But chances are it will increase. Chances are it will increase? Yeah, for, for revenue. For, for this one, I... This one I think it will, but I, I don't know for sure because what we're talking about with um, people moving away from some of these traditional ways of communicating. Like I know people drop their home telephone numbers now and stuff, so I really don't know. I mean, but everyone has a cell phone. I mean, that was a one for one swap, right? Or just a, yeah, I guess it could, it, when people cut their, had the cell phone and their regular phone, mm -hmm. and they dropped their regular phone, they lost that revenue, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I can tell you. The information I have in front of me to give you. So the document we've been studying is for 1617, and that revenue was 377,000 and change. Sorry, 387. Um, the this document, which was a projection for the 1718 year, looks like they were projecting 402,000. So that's a little increase right there. I have a question. Um, this is going to sound like kind of a dumb question, I guess. Uh, but is it, uh, are there things, are, are, are all of these things like fair game to be, to be raised if, if appropriate and if helpful? 
Um, we can tell you when we get to those that we can change. So like there are certain ones in here that we have some, that the city has some control over and others that that's just not, maybe we get some revenue from it, but we don't have any control over how much it is or when it comes or, okay. So far the only one like that that we have control over is the Avalorum one, which you guys know all about. And I think that's, that's it for so what we've so far. Is it, uh, is it possible for the city, I mean, and I'm not proposing this, uh, but uh, is it possible for the city to impose additional taxes on things that, I mean, for example, if the city wanted to impose an additional tax on gasoline, you know, gasoline at the pump, is that possible? Um, well, the gasoline example is not something the city can handle. That is... Um, that is not within our purview. But if you give me another example, I can look it up and find out if that's something that, because a lot of things the state has reserved control over. But there are some things that, that the city could do if it wanted yeah, to. There, there could be examples that we come up with. Like, is it retail sales? Could we tax retail sales? I don't actually, I haven't looked at that, so I would have to find out if the state allows the city to do that independent or if we would have to get some sort of, you know, special yeah, act. Do different cities around here have different sales tax rates? Well, I know the county sets the sales tax rate, and when there are specific, um, not community development districts, but specific um, Hammock Landing, which is off of Palm Bay Road in, in Palm Bay, yeah. um, I don't remember what that's called when you set that development, but the bottom line is, if you buy something there, you get an extra, it's either half a percent or one mm -hmm. percent on your, so that's like a retail sales tax, but it's, it's specifically something that was set up, I guess, for that, that particular area. Um, but I don't believe the cities have the right to just set a, a retail sales tax. But I'll double check to be sure. That would probably be good, I guess. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but on the other hand, I think I saw a circle for we took in $28 million in retail sales over the last year. So I mean, there's 30 restaurants in this town. I didn't realize that. But. I do know that, like, if you were to decide you wanted to tax the citizens um, like an assessment or like to get streets done. Um, didn't have the funding to do the streets so you charge an additional assessment like the stormwater assessment and that money would go strictly to fixing the streets. You could do that but all those things are normally I think by referendum like you'd have to go to the voters and have them passed and then they can be the amount of that. So. Right. If we wanted to create a bond or something. Correct. Same, same type of thing. So I want to uh, briefly remind everybody it, it is, uh, I think it is very, very helpful to the recording secretary that we, you know, raise hands and that sort of stuff and that gives me the opportunity to call out the name of the person that's getting ready to speak and, uh, and it really does help her quite a bit. I think it's, I think it's, uh, it's on you now still. So the next few line items from local business tax down to miscellaneous building permits. Those are going to be the items that are um, kind of housed in our community <coughs> development building and zoning area. Um, people come in and decide they want to do something to their house, they have to come get a permit. Um, those who have businesses in the city pay a business tax. <coughs> those are your local business taxes. Um, I know there's really much more to say about that. I mean, that would be something that if we wanted to raise the permit fees, I'm pretty sure that we have the ability to do that. Um, currently, the permit fees are based upon what you're going to be doing at the house, besides how much um, is charged for that permit fee. You know, whether or not you're going to put a deck on or you're going to put a roof on, they're different based upon what the job you're actually going to be completing. Any questions with those? If I may. Oh, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Mr. Whitney. This permit fee thing is interesting. And there might be an opportunity here. And I'm just throwing this out, and I really, I don't think this is the appropriate time to have a conversation about it, but I'm just thinking through this. If you're not a Home Depot, just picking on Home Depot for a hypothetical. And you order doors. 
they will come to the city and apply to the appropriate permits to, put those, to hang those doors around your house. Okay? The permit may cost $100, but Home Depot is going to charge you $250 for the permit. And the reason is that their justification is, well, they had to go to the city, they had to go get it, do all that kind of stuff. I wonder if there's not an opportunity for us to raise permit prices, but also make it very easy for the homeowner to pick it up themselves. So they would actually have a reduction in cost, and the city could see a, an increase in revenue. And the people that would be losing in that transaction <coughs> are the, the supplier, the contractor. I'll make a note to pass that along to John Stone, our, our community development director, and that's something he can answer for you during his presentation. Yeah, that's, and, and how would we communicate that to the community and so on? Because so, I've, I've lived here for four years, and I've had a number of contractors, yeah. and I always pay 250 275 and I know, like, if the city was only 93 bucks or something like that. So. Because I'm not sure, and John will have to explain that, because I'm not sure if there's some type of reasoning why the contractors to come in so they can verify the paperwork before a permit goes out, if that makes sense, compared to a homeowner. And we'll have to let John explain that to us. That's why. That would be the only, the only thing I would put that kind of way. I don't, you know, let's, yeah. let, let the professionals tell us what, what the deal is. I think John knows. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he does too. <laughs> Any other questions on that? Uh, so the next three line items are all your franchise free fees. The electricity franchise fee, the gas franchise fee, and the waste management franchise fee. I think uh, we probably all understand how those work. Uh, we've gone through the waste management and understand how that one works. I have a question just regarding that. Uh, in general, is uh, are the franchise fees that uh, the city of Satellite Beach gets from these three things, and you did cover waste management quite well, uh, but are the the franchise fees that Satellite Beach gets, uh, are they consistent with, with other cities around here? I mean, is that just the same? Everybody pays the same because you're getting the electricity from the same place and the gas from the same place and things like that? Or is, is, is Satellite Beach getting more or less? Or does that even vary? Right. I, think, um, I can get that information about other cities and what it looks like. I don't have it from me. 10% is not an unusual number from things I've seen before. But let me get the data and we can look at that. Um, in terms of the actual provider, did you have a question about that too? Or no, just in general. I, I mean, are we, are, are, are we, is that something that possibly we're behind the curve on a little bit? I'll find out. Yeah. Uh, further? I just want to make sure I'm following the bounds and all correctly. So we know waste management is proposed to go to 15%. You're saying gas and electricity are currently in the ballpark of 10? I believe they're 10%, yes. Okay, and you're going to check and see what other okay. is here. You got it. Thank you. Sure. That is a question, though. Why didn't you propose to raise those, those franchises as well? Well, one thing I need to check on because something in the back of my mind is telling me there's like, I don't know, these contracts were negotiated a long time ago, so let me check and see why 10% is in there and why, as I understand it, I've been told that's the max. I haven't actually verified that, got that when I talked to Courtney, so um, I'll check and I'll report back. I can't answer that unless it's right now. Okay, the next few line items are the permits, the fire permits, the alarm permits, and the solicitor permits. I will tell you that the fire permits, we did move from 15 to 25 in the past fiscal year. Uh, the fire permits are a lot of the, the main ones that we get are for people to have bonfires on the beach. Um, so that's where a lot of that income comes from. Uh, the alarm permits, we do budget a little bit for. The solicitor's permits, we don't budget for because, as you can tell, we don't do a lot of that, so there are a lot of items you will see that we may get revenue for, but we need to not budget for them because 
they're hard to budget for, and so we'd rather just leave the line item blank, and if we get money, great, and if not, then we're not behind. Oh, I'm sorry. Further. Okay. Um, for the fire fee, um, are you saying it was raised in 2016 and 2017, or it was raised for 2018, 2019? It was raised for 2017, 2018. What you're currently looking at is 16, 17. It was raised for the current fiscal year we are in currently. Okay, so based on that, where we are currently, can you tell if it's trending? Um, significantly higher or the same amount of all, like has the the increase decreased the demand for it or of course they left <laughs> yeah why well, yeah. not sorry <laughs> what I've heard the demand has not changed it's, the okay. demand hasn't changed but the revenue obviously increased right. it did it, it didn't um, deter correct it, it did not yeah. okay yeah, cool correct. Sims. Um, how much are those permits? Like, how much is cost to a one fire and beach? It's $25. $25, that's all? Mm -hmm. Really? Wow, we have a lot of money. Just okay. remember, you can only have them from the 1st of November to the end of March. Oh, we should market that. Mm -hmm. End of April? End of April? Okay. Sure. Not during turtle season. <laughs> we should capture that as a revenue opportunity to take a look at. To increase the fee? Increase the fees. Well, well, increase it again, I think, is what you're saying. Yeah, we just increase it from 15 to 25. So you're throwing out increase it again, right? Is that what I'm hearing? I think for this exercise, yeah. that it should be put on. We, we end up turning it down, but I think we need to have a more microscopic view of it outside of this, this meeting. Okay. Are you making a recommendation? Or? How do you want to? Oh, I, guess I, I thought you were capturing other things. I'm right? capturing these things, but I guess this is a, my first time. I should just say, like, if you all feel strongly about something as a group, it will help us to sort of prioritize. I mean, some of these are easy to do. Like, this is an easy math kind of thing. Probably. Yeah, I would second. Yeah, I would second that. Are we? Is that what we're doing? We're. Well, I, I guess I I'm think we need to figure that out. Some direction, right? Because. Um, you know, if one person is going to throw out an idea, but nobody else is really interested in it, I mean, there's some things I'm going to give you information back, because that's my job. But if you're asking me to make some revenue changes or some expenditure changes, if you all can just keep in mind that it would be helpful to us to know what you're really recommending we look at seriously, you know what I mean? And it can just be like sort of consensus, if you want, like I get five head nods and I know what to move forward kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm comfortable with, uh, I mean, as just a member, I'm comfortable with on uh, something like that, that just a general consensus is, uh, you know, is enough for you to, you know, to take that next step. And uh, I don't know how the rest of the committee feels about it, though. And I think you had your hand up just now. I, my thought was, do you want to put it in wrap-up and review and as a summary of things instead of the one-offs because then you could just say we've got X, Y, and, and then at the, if, forgive me, then at the end of the meeting, she would, you would report back to us and say, okay, here are some things that you guys made specific note of. I, I think that sounds like I a great idea. Yeah. Whitney? I was, my, oh, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Naturally, of course. <laughs> Can I just suggest that maybe when the fire department does a presentation, it's something that we bring up again then, rather than saving it to like the very end of everything, because if they just raise these to that, I'd be curious to know why they fix that. I don't know why, why 15 went to 25, and if there's a precedent, you know, for that amount, just to, just so that you have that information. Whether or not that changes your opinion. Mr. Mr. Record has yeah, I was just going to add that I think there were probably most of us around this table didn't know how much it cost to have a bonfire, and, and like you said, if we would promote that a little bit, heck, you know, let's let's do that. It's, that seems very reasonable. Twenty five dollars for a bonfire. If I may, what what I was thinking, and I probably should have shared that, <laughs> is. From my perspective, everybody that has any kind of revenue idea that pops up, we should capture that, but not have the discussion about it now, whether it's viable or not. Let's have a whole, cap, let's have a whole list of all these ideas, and then we could take 
a half hour, an hour, whatever the case is, put them up on the, on the screen and say, all right, we said this is an idea, what do you think? And then we can talk about it in group and see if we want to move it forward or we want to scratch it. That keeps you in the game. And if you think of something, even if it's silly, just put it out there. I, th I think that uh, uh, seems to be the, the general idea for everybody okay. from what I'm hearing. I, I guess what I'm saying is that, that that's not a, 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 a directive to have you start to go do research. Yeah. It's just to capture the list. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like brainstorming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Good to move Didn't forward? He? I think so. Right. So the next couple of ones are the Bulletproof Best Grant and the JAG Rocket ID Grant. Um, both of these were grants that the police department had applied for and received. So these are another one where we got the money and then we spent the money type situation. I will tell you, we have a lot of people in this city who, I swear, apply for grants on a daily basis to try to get more money for the city. So, that point. That, that's right. tying into my question. It's like, what are our resources against grant writing and actively sourcing those monies? Is there capacity only tapped, or how does it work? Um, there is capacity in terms of staff that can apply can write the grants and apply for them and successfully get the monies. Um, there's, uh, I would say, three or four people that are probably involved at some level and have done that successfully in the past on staff currently. Um, the challenge that we've run into times in the past is there's usually a match with the grants, so you have to have planned for that in the budget and make sure you actually have the monies available for the match. Most of the, most of the grants that we come across that we're eligible for the cities are matching in some fashion, whether it's a 25% or a 50%, you know. Yeah, but we've, we've been very successful in the past, uh, to Brittany's point. Is there an actual defined goal for those uh, staff members that, that have capacity to do it, uh, to, to say, this is what we're shooting for, this is what we can uh, um, balance the match against, et cetera, just, just so that we know it's sort of being maximized? There's not a, there's not a goal per se. What we've, what we've done historically is most of these grant opportunities, and they're usually state or federal grant opportunities, they come up on a cyclical, cyclical basis. So when we know that they're coming up, we'll look at things in our, in our budget typically, like capital assets is usually a great example. You know, we know we've got planned and we want to put in, you know, in, you know, lights and ball fields or have a playground or whatever the scenario might be. So we look and see if that's something that's coming up in the next couple of years, and then we program in to apply for that grant, as well as for the match, okay. and see if we get it. Okay. Do you think that, uh, do you think that that's covered uh, really 100%, that there aren't things that slip through the cracks and every, you know, big expense like that that we're going to have, that that's research real fully leading up to it, or do we, do you think it's possible we miss opportunities on that from time to time, not having a person specifically uh, dedicated to that type of thing, or as part of their, you know, monthly job description, so to speak? Well, it was actually was it last year, I think it was last year, or the year before, that we specifically added that, that as part of the job description for an administrative assistant who's in public works, because she's just very good at that kind of thing, and she has that skill set, and so one of the things she did <coughs> was created a spreadsheet to sort of track all these different grants, you know, and She's kind of our go-to person. If we have an idea for something that we want to try to fund, we say to her, can you look into this, do some research, whatever. Um, she's also the person that will say to us, there's this opportunity coming up. Do you have anything you want to start looking at? I, it's absolutely possible we've missed opportunities. I know we've had to not apply for some because of the match issue because we didn't have the funds available. Um, but, but we can certainly, I think we can always do more, I guess would be my answer. You know, it's always possible even if something that's out there. But it's certainly certainly not something you you can be able to categorize as low hanging fruit, so to speak. It's not something that's been overlooked by any means. No, no. In, in fact, um, from the story that I've heard, you know, predating my time here, it, it seems that a lot of the way that the city acquired the beachfront property was through grants, as I understand it. But I, again, I couldn't give you details. No, I think sometimes I see paperwork come across 
the desk and I didn't even realize they were grants out there for certain things. You know what I mean? So um, I, I, I do think that we have good staff and especially um, this admin assistant in public work. She does a phenomenal job searching for, you know, and if we come up with something that we wanted to spend money on, we, you know, even if it is budgeted, hey, go see if you can find a grant for it. You know, especially with a lot of the sustainability things that we have out there because they're always trying to give you money to go green and, you know, protect the environment type of things like that. So. Mr. Rickard? Just to say that I like the idea, though, to say, you know, this is the grants that we got this year. We're going to make it a goal to achieve that in the following year. You know, it's a goal or... But I like that it's in the, it's in the job description. That's a, that's a very good start, but I like the idea of a, of a goal. I, I guess my comment would just be that um, I do remember the grant writing team and all the grants we got in, and there's always the tail that comes with the dog, right? And it's this matching part you say, and how we ended up with that truck, I think, with our baffles and all that kind of stuff. So it's a slippery slope. Grants a little bit is the only comment. Worthwhile endeavor, but. Okay, so the Florida Traffic Light Maintenance Fees, um, this is something that is set with FDOT um, on a yearly basis. They come in and they, um, we send them actually copies of the um, FPL bills um, on a yearly basis and then they come up with a certain amount of money they pay us um, and it, this year actually went up just a little bit um, and actually went up for the piece that we had budgeted for this fiscal year as well um, based upon the uh, traffic light arms. So just to be clear, this is, is this the one where we paid the electricity for the, the lights? Mm -hmm. so the, yeah. So they repurposed some of that money? Right, so we send them, they they have certain lights on, especially on A1A, that are theirs, um, like the ones that just all got replaced. And so they ask us every year for the FPL bills so they can see how much those lights cost the city, and then that's where the revenue comes from. So another one of those, get the money, spend the money. May I ask another question? Sure, <laughs> sure. Um, so Florida Department of Transportation is doing all that with the masked arms and, uh, and all those corners and the sidewalks and, and all the pedestrian signs that are going to be available, pass-throughs and stuff. Do we have any input as a city as to any of the design of any of that or how it's laid out or how it impacts our traffic or what we do or anything? Or um, yeah, there can, were... Can I make one comment? Course, the, the, the reason I ask this is because I realized that in today's world of shrinking electronics, I don't understand why I got the world's largest aluminum enclosure on the biggest concrete pad right on the corner up here on A1A to run traffic lights and walk signals. I mean, have you noticed that giant aluminum enclosure that cuts off all visibility across well, the corner? Where? So where? Right where? at the corner of this castle and oh, thing. Can you catch it? I mean, if you have pedestrians at the stop at the walk sides and you pull up in the right hand lane, which has always been trouble, and the sidewalk has never been finished there, right? Now there's that giant aluminum enclosure and I was wondering well so that's my question. Do we have any impact on how they do that work? Um, yeah, so the we that has the impact on it um, for I guess a period of years because F D O T when they do things takes <coughs> a long time. Things. Um, again, something I can't really give you a whole lot of details because I wasn't here, but there were a lot of, whenever FDOT does any kind of big community project like this, affecting you know, an entire city, in our case, um, they actually are required to do all kinds of public meetings. You know, so there were, I'll call them town hall-like meetings as I understand it. I couldn't tell you how many, but I just know there were quite a few because they are required by law to go out and get all that input from residents. And, you know, put notices in the paper, and I don't know if they mailed letters out or whatever, but 
after those kinds of things so that they get all the input from the citizens as well as I know they dealt with the staff, you know, and I've been in these meetings before, not for this project, but they'll, they'll put out boards and they have big pictures of everything they're proposing and they encourage the public to, you know, give them comments and run the boards and do those types of things. Um, so there was a lot of public comment. There was comment that information would be given from staff. Um, I'm aware of the one you're talking about just because I've experienced it when I pull up there. So I will make sure that I pass that along to the FDOT project manager and find out, you know, what exactly, if there, if there are any options. Well, if, if you're saying that it's up to me yeah. to sort of make comments at things like this, I mean, how do I go about doing that, I guess, is what's yeah. my concern about, hey, no, you can't put this in here, right? It's, it's just one of those things that it's hard, it's hard to say how you can get everybody in the public who might be interested at some point in the future to be aware of the meeting when it, when it comes up. You know, again, I don't know if they sent mail out to everybody, but, you know, I think they were confident they would have put something in the newspaper, it would have been city council agendas. But we don't have anyone on staff that's regularly monitoring all that, or I mean, or acting on our behalf. Well, because it's, because it's not a city road, right, yeah, because it's not a city road. Because crossovers are in the right places for the right reasons. Okay. Yeah, so it's not a city road, so we don't have a staff member assigned to launch the project. But when we've had complaints from residents, we've had issues that we just saw and said that doesn't look right, we have contacted them and said, what can you do to fix this? So I will put this on a list of, is this something that can be fixed, and pass it along and see what they say. They may say, because I've heard this from them before, that's the size box we had to have, we had this much right away, and so that's all it is. But I'll at least ask the question. You know, I, I don't know what the answer is going to be. Member Berger. My question on the <coughs> traffic light maintenance fees is, is that a net zero figure so we collect back in the fee what the actual electricity expenses? That is correct. Thanks. Okay, the next line item is a um, newer line item. I may need your help with this one a little bit. Okay. This is the one where the fire department is billing the Medicare. Not for ambulance services. We have a community paramedic program, which are some of our EMT firefighter folks will go to people's homes and provide continuity of care, specifically after they have, um, like, been released from a hospital, for example. And, and part of the reason they do that is they're trying. One of the things that, that they're trying to mitigate specifically is people who fall again in their homes. So that's a big part of this community paramedic program. So they go and they just do essentially like wellness checks. And so we've discovered that there is a way to, through a third party provider, and the fire chief can tell you a lot more about this than I can, but through a third party provider, we can bill Medicare for some of these things. So it's, a, it's actually, it is a new revenue stream that the fire chief came up with, you know, I guess in the past year or so. And this, this does not reflect this was essentially we started the pilot project to see, you know, could this building situation work out through this third party provider? Because we're not a, a traditional medical provider, so we can't do the building ourselves. Um, so it, from everything I've heard so far, it looks like it's a very promising, and this was the beginning of it here, so there's more in this year's budget. I don't know offhand how much, but anyway. Mr. Schler. I guess um, that ultimately we'll discuss that from a philosophical perspective again about what business we want our fire department And that's, this is great, because before I was getting concerned about, well, they're doing all this stuff, and are we getting reimbursed? Because in other cities, people pay for that kind of stuff out of their insurance proceeds or family pays for it or something, right? Hmm. Back to you, Brittany. The next one, the state revenue sharing, um, is another one that I, we don't have any control over. <coughs> find out in July about how much we're going to get um, the same type of situation. Uh, the mobile home licenses, I don't know if hand, it's a small item, I don't really know. Mm -hmm. I said, wait, Andrew has one more question, I guess. On the, on the state revenue sharing, can you be more specific? Is that sales tax refund, refund or something? Or what, what revenue sharing are we sharing? Pretty significant too, three hundred fourteen thousand dollars a year. 
I'm sorry, what was that for? State revenue sharing. Uh, do you know what's, is this multiple things in the state revenue sharing line? Oh, well, I guess it's not critical. They give us money and it's good. Does it go up year to year? It goes up a little bit each year. I mean, as you can see, we budgeted for 314 and we got 320. Now, now, that's the thing. It says year-to-date actual. So we're here in April. That means we've already collected 319. Again, this, this is, is from October 2016, 2016 to the end of September 2016. <coughs> Make sure that, because we thought story. that it would be better to do a year. Now, of course, you know, you're more than welcome at any time to come get the year-to-date stuff. Um, I will tell you at the um, council meeting next Wednesday, um, staff will be presenting the second quarter budget report, which will be talking about the year-to-date. So... May 2nd at 7 p.m. So, if you'd like to stop in and listen to that. No, you are on mobile home licenses, so press on, press on. Uh, so, the mobile home licenses is, let's see, it receives proceeds from an annual license tax levied on all mobile homes and park trailers um, and tra travel trailers and fifth wheels. Mr. Whitney. That's just that's just a wash, isn't it? The half percent sales tax. Because uh, what? I don't understand. Is that money used for a specific purpose? Yeah, that's what I was just having her look up here because I think it's one of those half cents that was set up for you know if someone were I think set that's up for the lagoon, isn't it? Lagoon. The lagoon. The lagoon. I, I think no. that's the one. Preci Precisely. Yeah. That's what I mean. Well, the lagoon tax, I thought that was actually one of the county, so. Well, that's why this is interesting to me. Oh. Well, there was one that the schools did for infrastructure, but again, that wouldn't be coming into our revenues. There was one of the schools did a few years ago for buses. Yeah, Maybe the buses were part of the infrastructure, item, but there was a big fight about it, I remember that. But that's county also, isn't it? Yeah, if it's something they did for their purposes, we wouldn't get that revenue in here. Yeah, do we have a half cent sales tax for the benefit of the city? It's coming into our general bank account. <laughs> yeah, I, if I had to guess it's something global that the county did to do a half cent sales tax and then they're required by population or something. Yeah. It doesn't talk about half cent, so it's got to be a county because this is more of a state. I just thought it was interesting because it's equal to the deficit. Oh, I think we have it's ten thousand off six hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> it is. Isn't it? That's all right. So right here. Yeah, another half cent. Yeah, another half cent. <laughs> I feel like this is on the county controls, which I think she found out. How, so. how does it end up on here? I don't get that. So the local government half cent sales tax program generates the largest amount of revenue for the local government to both the state shared revenue sources currently authorized by the legislature. It distributes a portion of state sales tax revenue via three separate distributions to eligible county or municipal governments. Additionally, the program distributes a portion of communication service tax revenue to eligible local governments. Allocation formula serves as the basis for these separate distributions. The program <coughs> primarily purpose is to provide relief from ad valorem and utility taxes in addition to providing counties and municipalities with revenues for local programs. Did that answer anybody's questions? 
Is this a, is this a, uh, some revenue that's coming to us from the state based on a half? It, it's our little portion, from a municipality's portion of a half cent sales tax that was implemented by the state some yeah. time ago. It, it looks yeah. like it's the county. This requires county government's participation in the cost of certain services provided to county residents through Florida's Medicaid program. Although the state is responsible for the full portion of the state's share of the matching funds required for the Medicaid program, the state charges county governments an annual contribution in order to acquire a certain portion for the funds. Yeah, it's, this is one the county has to like vote to, uh, to approve, and then um, the money gets collected at the state level and gets divvied back down. Is there a chart on the next page that shows the allocation for the city? So that's it. There's three these three parts: the communications tax, the state share, the revenue sharing, and then the sales tax. Is the three parts? Or? Yeah, I think that's what you just read. It looks like the 20 um, for, yeah, this, this year. for this fiscal year, the projection was 642 thousand dollars. So it's a go up. That's a big coin. Thanks, Kevin. Mm -hmm. But this is this is already in there. I mean, this. I mean, this. This actually represents what was budgeted and what we got. And, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's already yeah. part of it. Yeah. We can't raise it, in other words. But <laughs> <laughs> well, we can avoid spending. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sell that fire truck. Put it in our savings account and sell that fire truck. So, okay. But I digress. Yeah. All right, we're gonna try to power through so you guys get it. <coughs> get for this group. Let's get yeah. for revenue. Yeah. All right, uh, the firefighter supplemental income. So this is another watch. Um, the firefighters get incentives through their payroll depending on if they have associate's degrees or bachelor's degrees. Then on a quarterly basis, I send a report into the state and the state refund this for those incentives that we gave to them. Yes. Um, can I uh, make a, a suggestion and you know see how staff and the rest of the committee feels about it? Do you think we can go through these and, uh, I mean, how does everyone else feel about this, that we not necessarily go through a detailed explanation of each item on here, except the ones that we actually might be able to, you know, have some effect over or that we might be able to use for the purposes of the committee? I Mr. Whitney, can, can I add on to that? Sure. Just let's look at the line items that are uh, material. And why is it seven hundred dollars, three hundred dollars? We don't need to understand that because no matter what we do, we're not going to impact the budget in any significant way. But the net, there's one coming up for one hundred six thousand. There's one for sixty five thousand. Seems so like we had three, three members agree right maybe away. Six or so seven. Or seven there's maybe six or seven left rather than thirty. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Do you all feel Brittany, Suzanne? Tell me which one you want to talk about. Is that no, no, we don't know. We're saying, I, I think what, we're, well, what I was proposing is that we, that you, for us, uh, go over the ones that we might actually be able to okay. Okay. do something with. Yeah, and if there's any that are significant amounts, even though they may be gotcha. out of our control, it's okay. Quick. All right, right, so real quickly, we'll go to the pilot hunt for one for the 106,000, because I'm sure that's the one that you guys are curious about. Um, so that is a pilot program through the 100 acres. Pilot is an acronym. Oh, it sorry. stands for Payment in Lieu of Taxes. So there's actually an agreement that governs this money coming in. Sorry, I didn't No, 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 I, I, I apologize, because I... Um, so the 100 acres, there's an agreement with the owners of that Instead of them paying taxes, they pay us um, based upon calculations in the agreement. Yeah. So if the, the agreement you would like to see the agreement, would be happy to post that up online. But that one, I can't. There's not much of any kind of technical control. So this, this for real expense against this land. No, it's it's absorbed into every other line. Right. 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 But the question is, do they pay more or less than 8.15 on the property? I can check on that. Yeah, I can check on that, but part of the challenge is because this is vacant land. Yeah. You know, you wouldn't, you know, they could throw a couple cows out there, call agriculture, and then we'd get. And then we'd be out of business. Yeah. So this is all Department of Defense. It all rolls up to DOD. Is it right? This is a real pain. There's not much we could do here. This has been struggled 
thrown by a lot of people for a long time. And it, it's Department of Defense can they pull the strings on this one. Yes. All right, so we'll move to the copying and record searches. Mm -hmm. That would be something you could change. Um, you know, we, we charge people to make copies or do faxes and things like that, so we could we could increase that. I think that's a bit true. I'm just, just me. giving you the line items that I know you could change. <laughs> the next one, the 65,000, those are um, SROs. Uh, currently, we have two SROs, security resource officers. Um, we have two SROs. The, uh, we pay, obviously, our police officers, so the money goes out, and 65000 comes in from the school district to help us pay for those. To help us pay for those. Is there, uh, and this is a curious question, is there an imbalance one way or the other in what that officers, uh, you know, what all of the resources associated with that cost the city versus what the, what we're getting back from, yes. She said. It just did the section um, So currently, if, uh, for a, an officer that we would just hire today to pay them full time and to arm them, you know, their uniform, all that fun stuff, it would be about $65,000. Per, per officer. That's benefits everything. Um, so currently, the county or the school board pays is about half of what it cost us to do this. Because they're paying us for two SROs currently, and those $33,000 piece. Each. I'm sorry, because this is last year's. This year's $66,000. So they're paying us $33,000 each, and we're paying out sixty-five dollars each. We can't do anything about that. We do not have the resource officers, right? And then we would lose the $30,000 a year. The SRO is, there really a is a very hot topic right now. It's, so. very, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. it's a very hot topic right now, but there's no requirement that we have to have them. Right? Well, is it, I, I'm not aware of an actual requirement that the city has to provide them. We do have an agreement with Brevard County Schools, so we have to see okay. what that is. Yeah, my understanding is it's required by the county to provide that resource. Yeah, the school board provides the city. But they're not fully funding it, so there's a... Can we control that? We can look at the agreement, um, but I mean, I don't think we can control the cost of it. Um, but I think, I mean, we could look at the agreement. I mean, obviously, as we all are very aware that it is a very hot topic. So for us to come out of the program, I'm not sure is going to look very gleaming on us, I guess is the best way to say that. Are, are our schools at Texas Run where they single access, single entrance schools? Uh, I think I just noticed on the surf side, it seems like there's a cable way around it. Um, I, I can't remember if all of them have been out of the schools in quite a while. On Surfside, there's a gate all the way around it? I thought that when I drove by, I saw there was a gate right there by where the front entrance is. I mean, I know that you can get, there's like a horseshoe. Right. And that's all open. Right, but beyond that, when you like get past the building, the first set of walls, I think, is a That's a gate. I'm not sure I would have to uh, uh, fill that. So, are the officers allocated where? The two? Like, the where's their cost? No. Oh, what schools? Yes. Surfside and um, mm -hmm. one of them is shared between Holland and Surfside. And one of them is between Delora and Satellite Heights. I think that's right. The two elementary schools mm -hmm. share the one. Holland and Surfside, and then Delora and Satellite Heights share the other one. That's how it works out. Yeah. And that's all these resources do. They're dedicated to schools full time. And I'm just trying to understand the math. So it's two people full time covering four things. They're fully um, in equipment and paid, and we get reimbursed for half of that. And it's a requirement. Well, that's what I'll check because it's a good question. We have an agreement. I don't know <coughs> what the legalities are of getting out of that kind of an agreement, and I don't know if there's any other mandate. But as far as I know, the mandate to protect schools has always been one of the school boards. Okay, we can 
change the next line, line, line item, the fire inspection services. We can change those fees. Um, obviously, a lot more charges doesn't do a whole heck of a lot. Okay, so from program activity fees all the way down to the Pelican Clubhouse rentals, those are the fees um, that we did just kind of update. We did touch upon um, the Pelican Beach Park facility rent, um, the gym and game room fees, the DRS rentals, the dog park. No, we didn't touch that one, did we? The Pelican Clubhouse rentals. We did touch a few of those. Um, I'm not saying that we couldn't go back and look at a few others. Um, you know, one of the things that we talked about with the Civic Center is, you know, we're getting ready to uh, to renovate the Civic Center with CRA. Um, so, you know, we talked about once that's renovated, obviously we could, we have a freeze in to raise the fees at that point, you know. So, um, those are the types of things that we're kind of looking at doing. Before you move on, mm -hmm. um, well, just quick, um, the actual list of the fees we did change here in the past few months is, is on your list of resources. Just so you know, it's on the website. I think, Mr. Rector, I was just going to, can you go into a little more detail on the program activity fees? Yeah. Do you want to handle that? Okay. Thanks. Your knowledge? Go for it. Okay. So those are the fees that people, um, you take a class over at the rec center, and you go to the office and you pay us $40 for that month that you have to take kind of lessons. That's the income coming in. Now, we contract with all of our teachers. They sign uh, annually a, a contract agreement with us our department and we pay them a percentage of those fees. So those teachers in the office sort of set those fees together of what, what we're going to charge for that tenant lesson. Now these instructors come to us and say, I want to teach this class. We've got to contract them. We make sure that they are qualified to teach a class. And then um, we'll work with them, do the contract, set those fees, and they get a percentage of, I'm saying $40, but and it's generally 75% of that fee. So you're seeing a lot of income coming in from that, but you'll also see on our expenses about between 75 and 79% going back out to pay the teacher for their time to teach that. So this one line mm -hmm. that you would explain as lessons? I mean, it's our, yeah, we have a, a, a it's pretty extensive pretty program <laughs> um, with That's a couple hundred kids in it. We, yeah. The lessons out of the, like the court, tennis courts, um, yeah, summer camps. Huge part of that is the summer camps that we we have there. Every inch of that building is full from the day school gets out till kids go back. Mm -hmm. And just to give you perspective, in the lobby before you leave, if you look for the recreation activity activity brochure, you can just see how many pages worth of stuff there is. It's, it's also, also online. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Miss Berger had something. Yeah, I know. Okay, so I heard that we met between 25 to 29% of the fees that are collected. The rest is expense, almost up to 70. We met 20 to 25%. Okay, sorry. Rate, yeah, 25%. Um, are our fees in line with similar communities? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Ours used to be, we used to get a much smaller percentage of that. When I started here, I was six years ago. Um, we've been working our way because at the time we were, we were trying to, to increase revenue. And so some of those teachers were getting, you know, 89%, 95% of their fees. And so we worked them down to this, this 75, which we felt was fair for their time. Um, and the administrative part, you know, the city getting the 25% to handle the administrative part of it in the office, getting rosters. So, I'm sorry, so we, you kind of have a matrix that says we're at we max, have, yeah. max we and, and it's max capacity for demand, um, and, and you kind of made it as, as uh, uh, revenue generating as it can. Um, we could always bring in more revenue. What we need is, is a unique teacher that can teach something that people want to take a class in. Because um, a lot of the facility space is full, but but there are there's always holes in the schedule where there's a room that could we could stick something in and 
you know, we evaluate the programs of, well, is this making any, are we losing money by having, you know, the air on and the electricity? So we evaluate all our programs that way. Um, and if we don't, if a program's doing really well and, and we're looking at something similar offered somewhere else and, and we're charging such a really low fee, we'll, we'll encourage that instructor to bump up their fees the next season. And, and we do that regularly. We're always done. Do you think it's possible that, uh, I mean, if we if we take that, you know, 20 or 21 up to 25, if we take that as kind of a given, um, uh, is it possible that there are other programs that can be offered that just cost more? And, you know, uh, not to exclude something that costs less, but things that cost more that would, uh, I mean, uh, that, you know, that would just generate more revenues just because they cost more. I mean, if you're still getting 25% of it, I mean, are, are there things that we to, could to, to prioritize the programs that? No, no. I, actually, no. I don't mean that. I don't mean to prioritize. No, I mean, are there other things that you were saying before that we all, you always have your eyes open for things that could be added yeah. if there's a hole in the schedule or things like that? Do you think there are other things? That uh, I mean, are there programs that other cities offer that people just very happily pay a lot more for, but we don't do it because we don't have the right person for it or something like that? I'm, we're, I'm not aware of any programs like that. I mean, we keep an eye on other people's programs all the time just for new ideas for ourselves and see if we can find somebody to teach something if, if we feel like um, we're missing, you know, an area. Um, I know we've struggled for the last few years for like an art teacher. We used to have, you know, some art teachers for kids, and and we struggled with that over the last few years trying to find somebody to do that consistently. We've had a few people try, and it doesn't mm -hmm. really take off. You know, we'll do it for a couple seasons, and then if, then if it's not successful, the teacher doesn't want to do it either because he's sure. wasting their time. Sure. But we're constantly giving out, um, you know, information about how to become an instructor with the city and anybody who's got ideas that, that want to come teach with us. The, our dance program, which, which I mentioned is pretty extensive, uses, you know, both dance studios after school through the evening. So that takes up a lot of prime time that you would put, let's say, like a Zumba class in there for adults because now you were, you, We've scheduled it for this particular class, you know. So middle of the day, there's a lot of rooms and space open, but that's because we're doing school. Now I know it's published, and I can just go and read it. But since you're here, I'll just ask: Do you, for example, do we have do we have a, uh, like a coding camp? I mean, my kids went to something like that in Orlando a few years ago, and it was really remarkable to me how much it costs, and went all the way to Orlando for it. Mm -hmm. Do we have that? We don't. Um, right now we don't have like a computer lab type thing set up. Um, our our um, science teacher who teaches in our, our lab um, has expressed interest in doing something like that, but we don't, right now we don't have a, a set up facility to be able Is it out of the question that something like that could partner with the high school that probably does have a pretty robust lab? Yeah, that's a possibility for sure. Yeah, and I'm just thinking um, Brevard Arts is fairly big. I'm wondering if there are resources we could tap in that community to see if we could, you know, get, get maybe those art gaps mm -hmm. or art capitalism and art opportunities. Right. Cool. Can you just that create the good kind of creates because or is it that old by the foundation or artisan space? I can't think of the name of it. Space. Collective. It's an art. It's an art. It's an art place. A place where you can go and do all, whatever different projects that you want to work on. It's just like a, a space for art, different artists. So I would tap that as a resource. Uh, it's right. It sits right next to Innovation Yoga over by the uh, Eco Brains. Little cafe sits right behind it. Uh, 
just make a small suggestion to the uh, to staff and the rest of the committee. I wonder if maybe each of us uh, on our own might, uh, you know, come up with, uh, you know, again, kind of brainstorming style and nobody, no ideas are going to get poo-pooed on, so don't be bashful about it. Just put together anything and everything that we think might be worthwhile and email it and, uh, you know, you could comb through that and maybe come up with something, I mean, just as revenue generating events or activities or things like that, that, you know, you can look through it and see if it's harebrained or if it actually does have some, possibly some legs. This is for a comedic effect. I feel it's necessary for me to say, sell that fire truck now. <laughs> Let the record show that Mr. Schlur really wants to sell the fire truck. <laughs> Ms. Berger. Last question. So you mentioned our, uh, a lot of the groups seem to think coding might be something to look at. Is there anything else specifically you and your team has researched and thinks is uh, something you wish you had instructors for? Let me bring you that back to you cool. when, when we do our presentation, because I know our, our program is the person who manages all of that. Um, I think she has an idea in her head of things that she would like. So, and she has shared those with me, but I don't have them off the top of my head. So. And when we do your presentation, you know, we could understand the matrix of the schedule and where you think those gaps are sure. and timing sure. uh, to, to help look at it. You know, because obviously for folks that are in full-time positions, filling the daytime slot could be problematic, mm -hmm. but you know, just figuring out where we can find paint, painters and yank them out of their studio and get them to do something or, or yeah. some code geeks, so um, cool. that would be great. And I will make the comment because you'll see, you know, we budgeted for 482. We actually only brought in 431. It's like, you know, little we sign everything there's kind of an ebb and flow with how many people are actually signing up for classes. So even if we were to bring in some of these programs, I, it'd be tough to say, looking forward before we've even started it, to commit, we're going to make this on it, because we don't know how many people are actually going to sign up for that. So that's one of those tough numbers that we, we usually set this fee based on how we've done in a prior year, um, rather than saying, we are, we are definitely going to try and make, you know, make this. It's like, well, it looks like things are trending this way. This program seems to be going down, but this one seems to be coming up. And that's kind of how we got to that number. Is there a resource to, uh, to kind of look in advance? I mean, when you're planning that for a year, you know, for the coming year, is there a resource to see, I mean, for lack of a better expression, to just see what people are into this year, so to speak? and try to recruit that. for that type of stuff? We do that definitely, even in our dance program, you know, cheerleading got real hot there for a moment, so, so they were doing cheerleading classes and tumbling classes, and when the Summer Olympics comes on, gymnastics classes, books with a wait list. So, yes, we pay attention to that and, and try to plan for that and schedule as much of those classes as we can to take advantage of that. Back to you, Brittany. Um, so the, the, the next one, I mean, there's not much you can do there, but many machine income, it's the sort of machine. We got a piece of that. So that's what I can the non resident fees, that's something that is actually going to be incorporated into the, uh, for the, for the tennis courts fees. They do charge different rates, whether or not you're a resident or non resident. There wasn't right. a separate line item for a while, and it's not going to be there any longer. It's going to be up and included in the rest of the other black stuff. Um, there's not much control over, um, there isn't much control over the police. Can I make a comment about the non-residents? Just, just for informational purposes. So, um, tennis courts is the only facility that we charge a resident non-resident fee, and that's because all of our other recreation facilities have grant money in them. And when you get state and federal grant money, you can't charge different fees. They all have to be flat across the board. So right now, there's not any grant money at that park. 
So if we were to apply for a grant and get some money to, to do some of the infrastructure projects and things at the tennis court, that resident, non-resident would go away. But we would try and settle somewhere in the middle there. Do you know if it was um, a do any of those grants, does that requirement sunset at any point? Do you know? I believe it's 25 years. Wow. Yeah, to see where we're From at. the completion of the grant. Yeah. I mean, I know some of these I'm in the process of trying to go through all of those okay. and make a chart for myself so that I know when, when we can step in. Yeah. Because if you put a playground somewhere and now that nobody uses that playground, it's in the middle of nowhere, but you pay for it with a grant, you need to keep it there for 25 years. And or you pay the grant back, right? Isn't that something, something like that? Like that. Okay. Uh, Ms. Berger? On the court finding forfeits, I know that we're going to hear from the Community Development Police on June 14th. Um, is there any way that we can ask them to be prepared to talk about um, speed enforcement um, and so that we can look at how resources need to be allocated for that and, and what sort of estimates could be made about um, collection? For increased ticket writing, basically, right? Well, uh, enforcing, yeah, enforcing, enforcing things. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Violators will pay. <laughs> okay, I gotcha. I think about the only other one that we could possibly change the cost of and be a process with the, the ordinance violations. That's, I think that's set by us, the fee is, and so we can look at changing that. Um, the rest of them are pretty well self-explanatory. Um, obviously, they're not really things that we actually budget for too much. We do get some bank interest, you know. Um, we sell a fixed asset, we actually get some gain on that. Fundraising projects is, um, the uh, bricks, they sell bricks, have them engraved, and then we keep them on city property at different trees in different locations amongst the city. So people pay us to buy the bricks um, from us, and then we get them engraved with their names or however they want to do it, and they, they stay on city property. And that's something that the city does entirely itself? The bricks? The yeah. bricks? No, we can't. No, I don't mean make the bricks, but that's that's not it's not wrapped up with uh, with a charity or anything like that. Yeah, something that's been done for years, I guess. Well, when when all the plaques and things on trees started deteriorating and they don't last forever, I guess a number of years ago they came up with the birth program. They, they so they started replacing those plaques by engraving a brick. Is so it? We still get maybe 20 bricks a year. Do you think that, uh, that and I realize that's a very small amount of money there, do you think that, that there is room to, uh, to do other fundraising type of stuff within the city that, that is effective and we just don't really pay attention to it? And I or do cities do that? I will tell you a lot of the fundraising things that get done in the city are for the other boards that we have, the Unification Board for the Samson Island. Um, that's where a lot of that fundraising stuff happens because there's a little fund that they're trying to make money to be able to, to care for the expenses that they have. I mean, they have a Samson Island work day every month. Okay, once a quarter time a year. Yeah. So, anyways, but... They go out there and they clean it up and they, a lot of volunteers go out and do that, but then there is a board for that and so they, they do that. The beautification board brings in money by selling um, magnets once or twice. They do uh, selling the plants. In, in each of the boards, uh, they, they have some, there's some cost associated with that too. I mean, I remember on the sustainability board, all the meetings were here at night with a recording secretary and the city manager right. and everything like that. Um, is, it, is it even reasonable to consider uh, encouraging in one way or another uh, boards to conduct more fundraising that, uh, you know, that offsets some of their expenses more and to be less of a cost on the city's budget? 
Is that is that reasonable, or is there, are their costs significant at all? I, I mean, it does involve staff and everything. Clearly, if you're talking about boards like this, I mean, to me, it's, it's a, I don't a little know. bit negligible. I mean, okay. I mean, so far, our costs, I guess, for this board would be, like you're saying, we run some power here, and you got some staff people hanging out, and we brush you some snacks. Um, Understood. But yeah, I, I don't know. If, I, it's an interesting question. I, I can't, I don't think offhand it would it would be worth doing. Plus, I guess the thing with the volunteer boards, the beautification board, some of those there's a, a good fit for maybe doing things like that more. But some of the boards are, are much more formal, you know, um, planning advisory boards, for example. You know, yeah. They, just, they, have to, they have to help conduct the business of the city, so I wouldn't... I guess what I'm I guess what I'm thinking about is, uh, for example, like we were talking about the Samson Island Board, yeah. and uh, and I don't know if there's ex you know any significant expenses associated with Samson Island itself, and if fundraising could become part of what that board undertakes, mm -hmm. as well as okay. yeah, exactly. getting people once every once in a while to go out and clean up and you know that sort of stuff. So that's Quite an interesting idea. Like, if you consider the cost of staff, public works to go out and do things to repair stuff. You know, people go out there all the time and damage the city property. You know, mm -hmm. like they vandalize things. Sure. You know, those types of things. I mean, there's the potential to look yeah, at other things to offset that. You know, to, to recover that stuff. Right now, yeah. the board kind of um, works to try and get um, like adopt the park groups that will commit their time to go out and volunteer. Because it's actual, like, it's the manual labor of it that can really be more than sure. financial expense. The expenses are, are minimal. Okay. But um, but people's time to go out and actually, you know, clear trails and fix things up. It's, so the board kind of focuses not so much on fundraising, but on trying to, to bring groups in to do that kind of. In the words of Gilda Radner, never mind. Well, that's a pretty good idea. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's worth putting out at one of the meetings. Do they have any fundraising ideas? You know, for the animals. See what they come up with. Yeah, not just that, but the call out. Any questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Burger. Um, I see there's a significant increase in the police department donations to actual came in at 10,400 and fire department was a double of you know what was budgeted. Do you know what drove that? So the police department, the 10 4 specifically, is uh, we had um, we have a gentleman who donates money to for our canine dogs. That's what that is. Oh, so it's actually net zero. It's Most of the donations yeah. are going to be net zero because yeah. they are offsetting um, the cost. Um, if you flip to the next, if you flip to the next phase, I mean, a lot of this is the same type of thing. Um, you know, the donations that the public works got those were for um, Moby maps that are. So we, the cost of those will be coming out of the public works department. So again, the offsetting type thing. The safety program insurance grant, um, that is something that over the last few years we have received. Um, so it just helps offset costs. Um, the same thing with you know miscellaneous revenues. There's not really any way to budget those types of things. It's just kind of little things that come here and there. Um, for example, we just had a, uh, on our behalf, there was a, a lawsuit of some stripe on, I don't even remember all the details of it, but it was like $398 that, that we received. And we didn't know what it was for, but it was somebody from the state on our behalf, something happened, like a, it was a class action lawsuit for like you know, computer batteries or something. So that's kind of where those, those monies go. Um, and then, uh, you know, the refunds from the prior year's expenditures and things like that is just money that we got back after the year was over, um, and that's where those things get put in. So, I think Mr. Schler had something. So, so, so for example, if you're the fifteen hundred dollars, you assumed you were going to get fifteen hundred dollars on a donation, 
and it will be used for police department equipment or whatever because that's our donations and you said I donate to this or something, right? Mm -hmm. But you ended up getting ten thousand four hundred dollars mm -hmm. and you made the comment that it offsets costs. So did we save some money in the general fund off of this ten thousand four hundred dollars or did we just spend it on more? Well, with the PD specifically Specifically with this. This, well, I just wanted to comment the fact that we knew that this gentleman was going to be donating the money. So when we put the cost in for the canine dog, it was the same year we were going to be receiving the money. So it wasn't the cost that we had. We were going to put in. We got the donation, so we went ahead and spent the money to have the canine dog because Astro was getting to be retirement age. So otherwise, we wouldn't have bought the dog. I'm not saying that because not but because if you budgeted it in specifically because you know we're going to get the money, if it we just happened specifically that we weren't going to get the money, then we were not going to get the dog, right? Or no, we would have gotten the dog because the dog that we have is aging out of the program; it couldn't continue. So we would have had to fund it out general fund. It just happens that there's this gentleman who's very supportive of the canine program. Right, right. But he was approached and we asked him, would you be willing to do this again? Because he had funded the last dog and he agreed to do it. If I'm understanding your question correctly, we would have had to buy, to buy the equipment and pay for getting the new But we assumed we were going to get $1,500 for it. Oh. Our budget, right? I think we got $10,400. Yeah. So we spent all the money. We didn't save anything. It we didn't offset any costs with that, really. Well, he wouldn't have donated the money if he thought we were going to save it. He donated the money for a specific purpose. Right. Is this a, is this possibly a, a question having to do again with, uh, you know, the fifteen hundred was what was budgeted at the beginning of the year, and and the ten thousand is year to date, which was recorded at the end of the fiscal year and it was sometime in that interim that the Mr. So-and-so was approached and said hey would you like to donate to fund the canine program again and so that's why there's that discrepancy there is that I mean is that kind of what you're asking Mr. Schwartz? Well I'm just saying she made the comment that it offset cost and I don't see that it did I don't see how it I don't see how I saved any money. So maybe it's <laughs> I, I mean, because I guess the it's on the budget. So if, if it's a donation, I would assume donations kind of outside the budget. So normally we have three line items here that say we regularly receive these budgets, or, so or is this just for one year? And these line items kind of go. Well, you have several questions, so I'm going to answer at least one. See if I got in the car. Um, so we're just putting a sort of a plug number for the budget for these contribution line items because we don't know what's going to happen during the year, to be specific. Um, regarding the timing of when we identified the dog needed to be replaced and when we had a conversation with this gentleman and when the budget had been established, I don't recall all the details offhand, you know, how it lined up. Um, to the comment about, um, you know, how the expenditures are revenue so I guess what, what Bernie was really just trying to communicate was it would have cost the city, whatever the number is for the dog, like $8,000, whatever it is, it would have cost the city that amount of money out of general funds and there would have been no bonus revenue to help offset that cost. Because this came in, again, I don't remember the timing of it, it was less of a direct expense impact to general fund. I think that's all we're trying to say. Um, I don't know if that helps or hurts what you're trying to get through, but. And I would like to point out to the committee that we're also closing in on uh, 9 o'clock, which I think okay. is Sims. Oh, you can finish. I just wanted no, to ask one last question before we finish. I thought you said um, something about a dog park. I didn't know we had a dog park here, but is it a dog park that uh, generates revenue? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. But it's not, uh, is it, oh, is it by the library? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So, um, so um, I was thinking, I'm wondering if a, another dog park, like maybe on the north end of, like on the beach, um, park, because I know there's a lot of, um, you had mentioned at one meeting, uh, Mr. Chastain, about um, people, like there's not really a place up here to take dogs, and a lot of people 
regularly take their dogs to the zoo, even though it's not legal necessarily. But I'm wondering if, if the dog park we have is already revenue generating, then perhaps another small park on the northern end of it. I don't know what a city property is, but um, um, and if, and if it is not um, something that we wanted to charge a fee for, maybe it would be uh, something um, that would be perceived as a give back um, rather than a fee increase or it's like a value for. Yeah, I mean, I'm yeah, just not opposed to looking at adding an additional dog park, but um, understand that with the dog park, the reason it's fee generated is because there's maintenance, so we pay for the mm -hmm. all the free huh? staff. We yeah, they do staff it. Yeah, it's not the it's not the not yeah. Dog, so so there know. is there's the cost of having it staffed. There's the cost of maintaining it because we have to do all the spraying that's for the fleas and stuff, and then the dog bags. Uh, so you don't require the owners of the dogs to um, do their own maintenance or clean up and pick up. They, well, yeah. it would be nice, yes. Yeah, supposed to be nice. nice. But not everyone does that. So even so, yeah. there. But our staff, no, our staff doesn't pick up after the people that are there. They make sure that the people coming into the park have the appropriate um, shop and um, that paperwork and that That's whether they thing. have current membership with the dog park or they collect the daily fee. But we provide the green bags for them to be able to clean up after their dogs. Huh. That's interesting. Uh, and Mr. Schler, we're going to have to... So, uh, two questions real quick, I guess. So we pay someone to sit at the dog park? When the skate park all day long every day? Or? No. Um, the skate park Not at the skate now park. is open more hours than it used to be. We used to staff it the whole time it was open when it was only afternoon until close. Now it's open 10 a.m. till close, and we only staff it in the afternoon. But we also eliminated user fees from from that, so we're not collecting any fees for the skate park to offset the cost. Of the dog staff. park, would you collect fees? The dog park, yes, we do collect fees, and that offsets and that helps offset the cost of the staff. So the fee we collect on the skate park does that, or the dog park, does that also cover the cost of the bags on Cassie Boulevard? It, it all comes out of the general fund. The dog park fee revenue goes into the general fund, and the dog because yeah, we have them all around. Green bags the park all come out. Not just in the dog park, they're actually all along the sidewalk that runs all the way around that sports park about around those fields. So it does help offset the cost. You know the horrible, horrible thing is I have heard people walking their dogs say they didn't pick up their dogs due because there were no bags in those little things that this, that. that Started, I think, as a legal scout project, right? They don't have the green bags on Patrick either, but I take my bags every time to pick up. Uh, I, bought, I bought a box of 500 bags, and I carry them, you know, it's responsibility. <laughs> That's a different meeting. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I'm about to get drawn into this, and I'm really biting my tongue not to. <laughs> so I move that we adjourn this meeting. Oh, so, oh, hold on. I think so, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm okay. Yeah. Do we need a Do we need a vote on that? I think you do to to stay at ten minutes late. I the norm. Like a move that right. Or can they consensus it? You guys can consensus. Okay, I can send okay. if everyone else does. Yes. Okay. okay. Did you have one quick question? Or yeah. Okay. I wanted to wrap up. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So you guys have said a lot of interesting things. Some things I get, some things I'll have to look into a little more and come back to you on. Um, and I realized this was rather tedious at times and didn't feel like you were maybe getting where you wanted to be, but um, this for me was an important start for us to, to jump into just here's where we're at. Um, so now I would ask, I think Jeff had said something that I was hoping to, to bring up, and that is that if you think of anything else, if you go out and you start Googling what do other cities do for you know revenue in the world, I don't care what it is. Please, please, email us. You know, remember, don't copy each other, but just email myself and Brittany so that we can at least start building these things onto the list. And if you come up with something that we've just, that's really what I hope to find, things that we've never thought of, you know, because I can, I can figure out all day long how to you know, increase to the maximum things that we were allowed to increase 
statutorily and whatever, and I can figure out all day long how to cut expenses. That's, that's obvious. But it's the new revenue sources. If we can come up with anything, I'm, I would be eager to hear. Okay, so that being said, um, we've done, as, as before, all the lists of all the things you guys have brought up. What's going to happen at the next meeting, and we didn't have time to get into it, but um, I wanted to point out to you that this document, if you continue on in this document, you will get into the expenditures, as, as was mentioned, and you'll start to see that we have pretty obviously departments set aside. So one of the first departments you'll come to is the clerk's department. That's one of the departments that will be presented next, I'm oh, sorry, May the 10th. So you're going to see your first two department presentations city clerk and the fire department. Those are two really big departments. What I would encourage you to do is go to those expenditure pages for those departments and start looking at those line items. Go to the budget documents. You can look at the organizational chart for that department, see how many people they have. You can read a little bit of information about what they do. Um, next week, you're going to get an email from me that includes all of the services that those two departments provide. And this is where we're going to launch into actual work on the expenditure side. And what that work will entail is we're going to, we have this list for you of all these things that these two departments provide, and we're going to ask you to look at the values that are on the boards over here and those services and how well they match up or not. And we're also going to ask you to um, look at those services beyond just the values, and we're going to have conversations about if we don't do this anymore, is there any risk involved? And that risk is things that we talked about at the first meeting. Is there a financial risk to not doing it? Is it something we know by law we have to do, for example? Or is it not? Um, we'll be looking at the risk related to um, our, our city reputation. If there are things that people expect us to do that we say, well, let's cut those things, whatever they may be, is there a risk there? Um, so we'll get into all that analysis. But what I, what I think would help you guys the most is to look at these expenditure line items online. We will send you the PowerPoint presentations next week. We're trying to get those to you ahead, a week ahead of the meeting so that you have those to review. And um, we will send you any other information that the departments put together in terms of handouts to sort of educate you a little bit more about what they do. Um, so all that being said, um, I really just ask that you all continue to think of things that we can do because I, I know we've got six meetings and we're two down and now we're really getting into some hard work that's coming up, you know. So um, thinking caps on is appreciated. Also, just as a side note, I wanted to clarify my conversation last time about the report that we generate at the end because um, someone came up and made a comment afterwards. So I just want to clarify. As, as staff members, we're volunteering to write the report from all the minutes that are taken, all the notes and everything. But if there is a member of this committee that wants to volunteer to write the report, I will not stand in your way. Um, <laughs> but the goal, the goal obviously is I'm not going to create a report that you will not have reviewed and fully vetted and all that. But I'm just putting that out there so I want to make sure if there is someone who wants to step up and write the report, I will be happy to oblige. <laughs> um, but beyond that, is there anything that I missed that you felt like we want to make sure we accomplish at the next meeting aside from the two department presentations? I mean, does anybody have any like burning things that we haven't hit on? Okay. Then just look for emails from me next week telling you that there's more information available for your review. I will actually email you when that stuff is on the website so you know to go and check it out. So um, I got a lot of follow up items, but if, that's, if you guys want any other comments, then I'm, I'm good. I said my piece. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion. Mr. Recker, motion moved that we adjourn. Second. Ms. Bircher, second. Oh, oh yes. yeah. Anyone, anyone opposed to that? <laughs> <laughs> adjourn. Uh, thank well, you that's all. right. You did tell me last time.